and honour. The London Assembly is the voice of London, composed of 25 members elected at the same time as the Mayor in order, in order to hold him to account and scrutinise his policies. Welcome everyone to our first meeting at the Crystal at the new City Hall. Uh, I want to particularly extend my thanks to those people who've made today possible and uh, this is the start of a, an exciting new chapter in the Government of London now that we've moved even further east. This is a Mayor's Question Time meeting of the Assembly, which means that all members are invited to attend and ask questions of the Mayor. May I remind members that in accordance with current safety guidelines, face masks are encouraged to be worn in the chamber unless speaking or unless you are uh, medically exempt. Members are also reminded that any electronic devices should not be placed in front of the microphones, which must be turned on to speak, and please turn them off once you've finished speaking. In case of emergency and any need to exit the building, guests seated in the public gallery should follow security staff and assembly members should follow the meeting clerk. Can I also ask the uh, clerk, Rebecca Arnold, to confirm any apologies for absence? Thank you, Chair. We have one apology today, which is from uh, Assembly Member Garrett. Uh, we have three Assembly Members joining us remotely, which is Assembly Members uh, Polanski, McCartney and Dr Sahota, who are with us via the Zoom call. Thank you. I begin with an update on recent Assembly activity since the last Assembly meeting. We've had a busy Christmas and New Year period. Assembly committees have held eight meetings so far in 2022. Our scrutiny of the draft GLA group budget continued via a question and answer session with the Mayor. The Budget and Performance Committee also questioned Transport for London on its budgetary pressures and, cross, uh, and Crossrail before submitting its response to the Mayor's draft consultation budget for 2022-23. The Police and Crime Committee examined a rise in hate crime incidents in the capital. The Transport Committee held its second meeting on Vision Zero and assessed the, programs, uh, the progress being made towards the elimination of road traffic deaths and serious injuries. The GLA Oversight Committee discussed the ballot counting arrangements at the GLA elections in 2024. The Health Committee examined the ongoing threat of COVID-19 to London, focusing on vaccine avail availability, update, uh, uptake, case rates and death rates. The Confirmation Hearings Committee interviewed the Mayor's proposed appointee to the Office of Deputy Chair uh, of TfL and recommended to the Mayor that Seb Dance should be appointed. The Housing Committee held an informal meeting to scrutinise overcrowding in London's homes and the Transport Committee wrote to the Chief Executive of Crossrail to ask how the Omicron variant will affect the expected launch date of Crossrail. I've also been notified by the Mayor of the appointment of Seb Dance as Deputy Chair for Transport under Section 67B, 1B of the GLA Act 1999. This appointment took effect from the 1st of January 2022 with a salary of £132,664 and employment on standard GLA terms and conditions. Furthermore, I have been informed of a change to the job title of the statutory Deputy Mayor, Joanne McCartney AM, uh, to Deputy Mayor for Children and Families to more accurately reflect the portfolio she covers in this term. Finally, I am assured that the Assembly would, will join me in congratulating all Londoners and GLA um, family colleagues who received awards in the New Year's Honours list.
In particular, I would like to congratulate the emergency services workers who received honours as a result of their commitment to keeping us safe. May I also say that I do believe that there was an omission from those honours, and that is in for, uh, to recognise the ultimate sacrifice that was taken by Fulajimi Olubunmu Adewole, um, who gave his life to save others. And I intend to take further action with the Assembly's consent to ensure that that sacrifice is recognised. Uh, can I ask the Assembly to note the interest set out in item two? Somebody has to say something, thank you. Do Assembly members have any disclosable uh, pecuniary interests which relate to the items on the agenda for today's meeting or any other relevant interests, including any declarations in relation to gifts and hospitality which are not reflected on the authorities' register of gifts and hospitality? I'll give a pause there to make sure yep, yep, we're all fine on that front. Uh, item three, can I, on the minutes, can I ask Assembly to approve the minutes of the London Assembly plenary meetings held on the 11th of November and 2nd of December 2021, as well as the London Assembly Mayor's Question Time meeting held on the 16th of December 2021 to be signed by me as a correct record? Agreed. Thank you. If I can now ask the Assembly to receive the Mayor's report covering the period from the 3rd of December to, uh, 2021 to the 6th of January 2022. The Mayor will now provide an oral update of, of up to five minutes in length on matters occurring since the publication of uh, his report. Mr Mayor. Uh, good morning, uh, everyone. The easing of COVID-19 restrictions is great news for our city's economic recovery. It's been made possible by the fantastic efforts of everyone in our city, including our amazing NHS staff and volunteers who've worked around the clock to administer the life-saving COVID-19 vaccine. But sadly, this is not the end of our fight against the virus. If we've learned anything from this pandemic, it's that we must not get complacent and undo all our hard work and sacrifices. We know that wearing a face covering is one of the single most important things we can all do to prevent the spread of COVID-19. That's why face coverings will remain a condition of carriage on TfL services to help keep us all protected and to prevent further restrictions from being necessary later down the line. Chair, this is uh, an historic uh, Mayor's question time because it's the first to take place at the new City Hall. Our move here will not only save tens of millions of pounds, which will be used to help protect vital frontline services but it will help to drive the regeneration for this great part of London. Making sure that all Londoners are able to share in our capital's prosperity, regardless of whether they live in the east or the west, the north, centre or the south of our city, has always been one of my top priorities. And I'm excited today that we're opening this new chapter in City Hall's and London's history. I'm also optimistic that our presence here at the Royal Docks can act as a catalyst for greater economic activity, job creation and investment, and the growth and success of local businesses. Chair, the impact of this pandemic means it's never been more important to get behind our business community. And since we last met, I've been fighting the corner of London's businesses by lobbying the government to provide more financial support while COVID restrictions remain in place. I don't want to see any of our businesses go under. But the reality is many, particularly in our world-renowned retail, hospitality, nightlife and cultural sectors, 
are struggling to stay afloat as Londoners and visitors exercise the caution urged by government and stay away. New data released by the GLA today further underscores the severity of the situation with our analysis showing that tourism in London may not return to pre-pandemic levels until the middle of the decade. The government cannot simply stand by and watch while potentially thousands of businesses go to the wall and countless Londoners are at risk of losing their jobs. That's why I'm renewing my call today to the Chancellor to urgently step forward with a more comprehensive and ambitious package of support for businesses and workers in those sectors that continue to be hardest hit. As ever Chair, I look forward to answering questions from the Assembly uh, today. I've been asked for uh, four separate uh, oral updates, so with your permission, I'll, I'll go to those. The first one's from uh, Caroline Pigeon uh, on the Met Police Service action on Downing Street parties. Any police investigation is an operational matter for the Met Police Service and is not in my remit to direct. The public rightly expect the police to uphold the law without fear or favour, no matter who that involves. This is key to ensuring that the public have trust in their police force, something that is fundamental to the principle of policing by consent. That's why it's so important that all police forces act and are seen to act in a way that's impartial. Londoners and people from across the country have made huge sacrifices during the pandemic. I've been clear that Londoners must be able to expect the highest standards from the Prime Minister and those around him. That cannot be one rule for the government and another for everyone else. The second request, Chair, is from uh, Anne Clark in relation to uh, the Secretary of State's statement on building safety. Four and a half years after the Grenfell Tower fire, it's unacceptable that thousands of Londoners continue to live in a state of fear over the safety of their homes and anxiety over the cost to make them safe. I welcome the government's latest announcements that industry is expected to fund cladding remediation on buildings between 11 and 18 metres in height and that remediating the building safety crisis needs to be fronted by government and industry, not leaseholders. Developers and manufacturers must be held accountable and the government must reform the flawed regulatory regime. I also welcome the government's announcement that the Consolidate Advice Note, CAN, has been withdrawn. The CAN caused a lot of confusion in the sector and it, it, it is time we move we move towards a more proportionate approach to risk assessment. The government also announced it would make £27 million available to install fire alarms in high-risk buildings, an important step. However, this alone won't restore confidence in the market. We need funding to be committed towards the remediation of all building safety issues, and we need robust regulatory reform. To ensure lease hurdles are protected, protected in legislation, the government must now make the necessary amendments to the Building Safety Bill. Chair, the third request for an oral update uh, was from uh, Tony Devonish in relation to TfL speeding prosecution target. Speeding is the single biggest contributory factor in fatal collisions in the capital and the level of non-compliance remains too high. Reducing speed and speed-related collisions is central to our Vision Zero goal of eliminating deaths and serious injuries from London's transport network. Enforcement and policing activity play a critical role in challenging the culture around speeding. The Met Police Service does more speed enforcement than any other police force in the country, but over 3,000 people were killed or seriously injured on London's roads last year. TfL's Vision Zero Action Plan progress report, published in November, includes a new commitment to have the capacity by 24-25 to enforce up to 1 million offences per year against drivers who continue to speed. The Met Police Service prioritises enforcement in the areas where non-compliance, risk and harm are the highest. No, deaths, no death or serious injury on our roads is inevitable or acceptable, and expanding our enforcement capability will enable TfL and its policing partners to respond more effectively to tackle one of the greatest sources of road danger. 
And Chair, the final request for uh, an oral update came from uh, uh, Zach Plansky, who joins us uh, virtually. On Tuesday, a report commissioned by the GLA set out the action required for London to achieve net zero by 2030. The new analysis shows that we must take more action to reduce vehicle use in London. I've already taken groundbreaking action by introducing and expanding the ultra-low emission zone. But to achieve the 27% reduction in car use the report says we need by the end of the decade, we have to go further. That's why I'm considering policies to reduce emissions in this mayoral term further. I've not made up my mind on which of these options will work best for London and TfL are working on those options. Further in the future, we will need to consider a new kind of smart road user charging system for London. Such a system could replace all existing road user charges, such as the congestion charge and ULES, with a simple and fair scheme which, where drivers pay per mile. There could be different rates depending on how pollution vehicles are, the level of congestion in the area, and access to public transport, with exemptions for people in low incomes and support for charities and small businesses. Chair, I think that's all the oral updates. Uh, thank you very much. Um, and joining us remotely, Assembly Member Polanski. Thank you very much. Um, I'll be brief. Uh, Mr. Mayor, you'll have noticed the enthusiasm that your road user charging announcement was received by Green Assembly members because we've been campaigning on this for years. In fact, since 2016, when my uh, colleagues Sean Barry and Caroline Russell were elected, I have lost count of the number of times that they've pushed you, pushed you on a road user charging announcement. So we're really pleased to see that there. Um, we're still going to keep the pressure up, though, because we need speed with this. It has to be urgent. It needs to be genuinely fair. And we need to make sure that privacy is guaranteed. But I'll leave, there now. I'll leave it there for now. It's just to say thank you very much, and we'll keep up the pressure on this. Assembly Member Pigeon. Thank you. I'm aware it's an operational matter, but are you satisfied with the way in which the Met has responded to reports of parties at both Conservative Party head office and Downing Street in recent weeks? Look, I mean, uh, thank you for reminding uh, me and others that it's an operational matter. There's a very good reason why the Police and Crime Commissioner shouldn't be directing what the police does, but also give the impression of bias uh, on, the, on the part of the police who do police without fear or favour. So separate from a specific incident and, and my influence uh, over, over that, I, I think there is an issue about policing by consent. There is an issue about the public having confidence that everyone ab abides by the rules that encourages them, therefore, to follow the rules. And if an impression is given that there's one rule for these guys and another rule for the rest of us at a time when they appear to be laughing at us, that doesn't bode well for trust and confidence. Thank you very much. Assembly Member Devonish. Uh, Mr Mayor, good morning. I agree with you on road safety, but is it really necessary to have a target of one million? Couldn't we have more carrot and less stick, please? Well, I think just to clarify, uh, Assembly Member, um, there isn't a target for um, the million. There's a, a, a commitment to have the capacity to enforce, and I'm sure you'd agree Nobody wants people to be breaking the law, potentially causing death or serious injury without the ability to enforce. Uh, and that's why it's important for us to support the police in building up the capacity uh, so, so, so the rule breakers can have the law enforced. The ideal situation is for there to be zero enforcement because it's not required because everyone's following the rules. Thank you. Thank you. Assembly Member Clark. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I'm, I'm glad that you recognize the issue that this is not just cladding. This goes, it's far further spread. And as, as elected representatives, um, you know, we represent a large number of people who find themselves in a situation where there's an announcement from governments and they're left behind again, and their situations haven't improved. As elected um, representatives, what hope do you think we can offer leaseholders and those still living in these buildings that aren't going to be touched by the government's announcements. What, what, what message can we, can we share with them? Because it's, it's still a desperate situation. Well, firstly, can, can, I, can I commend you and other members of the Assembly on a cross-party basis who have been campaigning on this for the last few uh, years. 
We should have some comfort because Michael Gove has done what the previous Secretary of State said was impossible and give some support to these leaseholders. And we should welcome the movement by the government that I've set out in my answer. There are a number of areas, though, where the government still needs to move more. One is for those living in buildings uh, which are unsafe, which are less than 11 metres tall. Secondly, uh, those people who live in buildings where there are non-cladding defects. Uh, the chair was personally witnessed and helped in relation to fire where wooden, wooden balconies was a concern, shorter than 11 metres, but also non-cladding. They're not helped at all. And the third big area where we need support from the government is to reimburse those leaseholders who've already begged, borrowed and stolen uh, to pay for remediation. They should be reimbursed uh, by developers and or the government. But we've got to carry on the campaigning, carry on the lobbying. Uh, this June will be five years since uh, Grenfell, uh, and it is uh, an outrage that there are still thousands of people across uh, the city, tens of thousands, uh, dare I say it, who live in unsafe buildings. Assembly Member Duval. Mr. Mayor, going back to the policing issue, it's right that our operational policing should be less to, left to the police. But what is really galling and makes people angry is the issue is that during that time of these parties, weddings were broken up, rightly so, because people were breaking rules and engaging with rules. Things went on and took place where the police need to walk the extra mile to explain to the public why no action is being taken. It can't be right that the great and good get away with it while the ordinary public are taken into the courts, have weddings disruptions, told not to do this, told not to do that, while people in charge in national government flout the rules and vagrantly break them. So can you ask the police, I don't think it's interfering with operational policing, is it right to say, please explain to members of the public why you're not taking actions on these occasions. I don't think that's political partisan. I'd be saying it even if Labour was in control. Other politicians might not. It's what should have happened during a national emergency. We all followed the rules. We should all be guided by the rules. They were, fl they were flouting it. They should be brought to task. But the police should explain why. Well, Chair, Chair, listen, uh, both of them, Caroline Pigeon and uh, Len Duval, are articulating in a very polite way, the anger felt by millions across uh, the country. I think we can you know, take it as I said that not only will I, but the Police and Crime Committee, uh, the Home Affairs Select Committee, and many others will be ensuring uh, that justice occurs and justice is seen to occur as well, because it does affect the confidence or lack of in the police going forward. And that's why it's so important uh, for the police to show that they do police without fear or favor. Thank you very much. Then no other questions. Um, can I just at this point welcome the public gallery? I didn't make a particular point of it, but you're welcome here to this part of uh, London's, uh, the uh, new chapter of London's history. And I, I know there's, there's representatives here from uh, guardians of the arches and also rep people who um, have... <laughs> and people from the... Uh, the Silvertown Tunnel Coalition as well. Um, we now move to the remaining questions on the priority order paper. Each group is allocated an amount of time to ask their questions that is proportionate to their size. The first question is concerns TFL business tenants and that's in the name of Assembly Member Best. Thank you, Chair. Can I, can I thank the uh, member for uh, her question? Uh, she has the privilege of being the first question asked in the new City Hall. Congratulations. Um, I'm proud of TfL's commitment to helping the hundreds of businesses on its estate, 93% of which are small and medium-sized businesses, to recover from the pandemic. From the very start of the pandemic in 2020, TfL was the first major landlord in the UK to commit to full rent relief for the first three months and TfL has continued to provide significant support to its tenants, many of whom have worked tirelessly to continue trading through these challenging times. Throughout this time, TfL has worked with groups like Guardians of the Arches, and it is lovely to see them in the gallery today, and the Federation of Small Businesses, 
which have provided invaluable advice on TfL's approaches, as well as providing guidance for tenants. Throughout the last 22 months, TfL has supported business tenants in a variety of ways, including full rent relief, awarding direct rent credits, providing more time to pay down pre-existing arrears, giving support in managing rates claims, and allowing tenants to move from quarterly to monthly rent payments to allow for easier budgeting. TfL has also provided free access to storage space to support social distancing when this has been required. In addition, TfL has not increased rent levels for small and medium-sized businesses, even where rent reviews have been due. TfL has also supported full flexibility for its tenants based on their needs. For some tenants, this has meant setting rents based on turnover, while in other cases, TfL has allowed for a percentage of the usual rent to be paid. For those tenants wanting to leave their properties, TfL has provided a simple exit process. TfL has also been meeting tenants and completing business health checks so that it can provide targeted support that addresses individual businesses' needs. Based on feedback, TfL has put in place new policies and is continuing to evolve how it operates as a landlord with the aim of continuing to work in partnership with its tenants to drive long-term mutual value while supporting London's recovery from the pandemic. TfL is proud of its predominantly SME tenant base, which reflects the diversity of London. Ultimately, however, getting London moving again will be the best way to properly support the recovery of these businesses and of businesses across the capital. When London moves, customers pour through our stations and stops to take advantage of local shops, cafes and businesses. Restoring this flow of people will be crucial to the long-term health of both, London's, uh, both TfL's tenants and the wider London and UK economy. Assembly Member Thank you. Uh, sorry. Uh, thank you, Mr Mayor. Uh, and first, I'd like to thank all the businesses uh, for coming out today. Um, I've had the pleasure over the last month or so of meeting so many, and I just know there's no way I can possibly do justice to the pain that they are feeling and the stress that them and their families and staff are under. And so I feel a great weight trying to get that across to you today. Because we aren't talking about the Jeff Bezos of this world. These are regular Londoners and people that have built something really phenomenal, phenomenal from the ground up. And so many of them risk losing that or have lost that already. And I understand all the measures you've laid out there, Mr Mayor, but you must recognise these have been inconsistent, especially across the London underground. They haven't received that level of support and they are on the brink. You know, we have people that are relying on food banks for the first time in their lives that just don't see a way forward and they need more. So I have three asks today, Mr Mayor, and the first is could you please apply a singular strategic line management model so you have the Archer's tenants uh, and the management team over the whole of TfL? Can we have one consistent approach so everyone can get, have access to that support that they so desperately need? I'm sorry, there are three, three asks. I'm just right. going to take them one by one to see oh, so we can... Yeah. Sorry. OK. Well, can I, can I thank uh, the guardians uh, of the Arches for being here? Uh, I've got friends and family who have businesses in Arches, uh, and I've seen the difference in the way TfL has treated uh, our tenants versus Neville Grell and others, and I'd rather be a TfL tenant than a tenant of a different landlord in the Arches. And so the re I, th I think there, there, there is, and, and the Garden of the Arches meet TfL regularly, in addition to deputy mayors who work for me, and I've, I've met with uh, the leadership of Garden of the, of the Arches uh, as well. Uh, we are moving towards one line management approach, but it's not going to be a one response approach because we want to make sure we help different tenants with different needs. So, for example, for example, with a tenant who's got particular cash flow, we give different help to somebody with a different cash flow. And one, of, one of the things we're trying to do is to make sure there's... Uh, one, one person they can approach because the, the confusing matter is when you're approaching different people. If you're a small business uh, with one person... Can I... Uh, excuse me, Mr Mayor. Can I, can I just remind the public gallery that they are here to listen and I'm sorry that I've had to uh, uh, say this, but if, if you could listen to the mayor, what the Mayor is saying and not try to interrupt him. Thank you. So we're trying to have is, is a one-stop shop but for there to be flexibility so different tenants get different help depending on their needs. 
I appreciate the commitment to a, a one-stop shop and a and one-stop module, and we'll see how that plays out, but what is key is the, the consistency in that. Uh, the second ask, Mr Mayor, is if you will meet with um, these tenants personally um, to hear firsthand the compelling stories they have um, of where this is going wrong, because I think once you hear that firsthand, there's no way that you won't see the pain and the inconsistency um, and where perhaps TfL have big aims, but on the ground, that's just not happening. So will you meet with them? Well, one of the things that people like you've got to be honest about is the pressure on TfL from your government. So your government is saying that TfL is going to raise more revenues and should be making those revenues from these hardworking tenants. And so we need your help to say to the government, say to the government, stop bashing TfL and encouraging us to bash those tenants. And, and because Mr. what the government is saying is TfL must raise more revenues from hard-working families like these tenants here. So what we need is for your help to lobby the government and say stop. Mr Mayor, and what I'd like is for you to meet. That's not the answer to the question. The question well, is, will you meet with tenants? You can say whatever you, like. you want and you can say to them whatever you want. You can say it's the government's well, fault. I will come with you on that call and if there's something we need to ask the government for, I will do that and I will join you. Well, but what I'm asking before. for you is... And when have you ever emailed me? When have you ever asked me to do anything? Well, so, I, I'm Chair, I find it astonishing that this member doesn't know the financial challenges TfL faces and hasn't heard me at previous yeah. Mayor's question. It's about the tenants, and I'm asking you if you will meet with them. I will meet with them as well, and you can say whatever you like on that meeting. The question is not that right now. The question is, will you meet with the tenants? I, I find it astonishing, Chair, uh, that the member isn't aware of the pressures being brought on TfL, which is leading to... Uh, I'd appreciate it. We can... Uh, Mr Mayor, if you'd like to answer the question. Which is leading to the challenges that we see TfL facing. So TfL as a landlord is required by the government to increase revenues. 72% comes from fares, which is shrunk, and so they're asking us to raise revenues elsewhere. One of the things that I do know, not only have I met Guardian of the Arches in the past, not only did TfL meet them regularly, but two of my deputy mayors have met with uh, them uh, as well. I'm always happy for deputy mayors who can see members of the public sooner than I can to meet with guardians of the uh, arches. Of course, I'm more than happy to meet all rep representatives from the business community across London. I meet them regularly, including, as I've said in the answer to my question, the Federation of uh, Small business Businesses. And I'll be honest with them in relation to the challenges that TfL faces because of pressure from the uh, government. I'm not going to hide uh, behind telling Londoners the truth about the pressures that this government's placing on small businesses like the ones behind you. So I can contact your diary assistant after this meeting and set up a meeting. Chair, I've answered the question in relation to... Uh, that's, uh, my, my, that's my question. My, my more... See, it's quite clear they don't like the fact that I'm illustrating some of the consequences of their government's action on uh, TfL. And I'm afraid you're going to have more and more tenants across our city, not just those in our arches, but those across our city suffering the consequences of TfL has a managed decline scenario. And that's one of the reasons why we'll continue to lobby the government for more funding for TfL. Thank you. I, 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 I think it's really sad. I'm not trying to play politics, and if there, we need to solve these issues together. People are going through real issues, and all I wanted to ask was for a meeting that we could discuss these together and be honest with the tenants and have a, a deeper conversation. But my final ask is if you will um, uh, commit that there will be no evictions in March from TfL premises. Well, TfL has worked really hard to ensure there are no evictions unless tenants want to uh, leave. There are 2,500 uh, tenants. One of the reasons why your first ask for a, a one-size approach is not sensible is because different tenants have different needs. And so I've set out some of the things that we are uh, doing. TfL will not uh, evict a tenant who has got a viable business and who wants to stay. Uh, what they will do is come up with a system that works for that tenant. And that's why the first ask you had of a one-size approach doesn't work. Some tenants have been given rent credits. Uh, that's cost <coughs> TfL 30, £37 million, which your government is saying we've got to pay to the uh, government. £37 million we've given to businesses by way of rent credits, and your government is saying that we shouldn't do so. The monthly rents uh, we've gone to, rather than quarterly, to help the cash flow is also something that your government is uh, not amenable to. And so where we need your help is in relation to putting pressure on the government to stop uh, making it difficult for us to be a good uh, landlord. And I'm more than happy to compare and contrast 
TfL's uh, landlordship of these businesses uh, versus others uh, in our city, including Network Rail. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I, I didn't see. So I, I, that was a commitment that you won't. There won't be any evictions. I've made clear where a tenant wants to leave. Uh, we'll make sure there's Unless a good exit like package for the tenant to uh, uh, leave. The other commitments we can give is uh, no increase in rent levels, uh, where reviews have been made uh, uh, due to, uh, to SME businesses. No, uh, uh, we're also going to allow we're also going to allow more time uh, for, for tenants to uh, pay up down pre-existing uh, arrears, and we're also going to continue to give more support in relation to managing rate claims uh, as well. And if there are other things that other landlords are doing. Uh, that we can be doing as well. I'm sure TF will be more than happy to listen to those uh, 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 suggestions. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. As we can see, that people's lives are on the line, and I would hope that we can do everything we can. I didn't uh, suggest we have a one-size-fits-all approach, because that won't happen. But one team pro providing consistent support, because people have been through two years of a pandemic and received <coughs> nothing, and they are hurting. And that's it. Thank you. Thanks, Chair. Thank you. The next question it concerns drug enforcement and drug harm from a, a Assembly member, Russell. Thank you, uh, Chair. Uh, drugs can ravage communities and the supply chains support organised crime and serious violence. My number one priority is the safety of Londoners, and that means tackling the harms drugs cause. The Met Police Service is committed to suppressing violence and targeting individuals linked to drug-related violence. I'm also determined to end the exploitation of young people by organised criminals involved in drugs. And I've invested £5.7 million in a three-year rescue and response programme to target county lines. The Met Police Service is working closely with rescue and response through Operation Orici. There's, grow there's a growing demand for a debate on our drugs laws. And in my manifesto, I said I'd establish a London Drugs Commission of independent experts from the fields of law, public health, criminal justice and community relations to examine the effectiveness of those laws with a particular focus on cannabis. The Commission will consider ways to improve the current legal framework on the use of cannabis, as well as the criminal justice and public health responses to drugs use. What the Commission will not do is look at the classification of Class A drugs, which I'm very clear must remain illegal. Work is underway to set up this Commission. The Prime Minister himself has acknowledged in the government's recent drug strategy that the old way of doing things isn't working. My London Health Inequality Strategy has already taken steps towards a different approach, seeking to reduce the use of illicit drugs and reduce health harms through high quality drug treatment and recovery. The enforcement of drug laws and the wider criminal justice system must look to support this approach. And I'll continue to work closely with health, criminal justice and local partners to improve pathways into treatment from the criminal justice system. Drugs are driving violence, crime and antisocial behaviour in our communities and now is the time for an evidence-based review of how to reduce the harms that drugs like cannabis cause. I was pleased to see the government's new drug strategy acknowledge the need for robust evidence to inform a national debate on how best to tackle addiction and provide effective treatment and recovery systems across the criminal justice and public health sectors. I'm doing my part to help provide this evidence in London. Thank you, Mr. Mayor, and very good to hear you say that the old ways of dealing with these issues are not working, and also uh, recognising the good stuff, the, the good stuff that was buried in the, that public health-based approach to tackling drugs that was buried in that recent uh, government uh, strategy. Now, I've seen reports in the media recently that needed to be clarified by your office about cannabis diversion trials where 18 to 24 year olds who are found in possession of a small amount of cannabis will be given advice on drug harms and will be taken back to their homes instead of going into police custody or receiving a criminal record. Now, uh, this kind of trial, it's not about ideology or politics, it's practical, evidence-led, and it's common sense. Now, we heard in the October Health Committee meeting that diversion schemes are not only within your power as mayor to do, but also that health interventions such as these are often more effective than punishment and criminalisation. Do you know when these diversion trials are going to start and what more information can you provide on them? Well, I, I, unfortunately, Chair, I can't give you a date for if they'll start. Uh, 
no proposals have come to me uh, yet. What we do know is that there are some police forces around the country, Thames Valley, uh, Durham, West Midlands, that are doing uh, these pilots and these uh, trials uh, uh, and it's on a cross-party basis. Some of those police and ground commissioners are conservative. Uh, and it's in accordance with, as you said, uh, the, the government's recent drugs strategy. So uh, a proposal will come to me at some stage. Uh, I'll look at the proposal. I don't want to preempt what I may decide. Okay, well, I'll uh, encourage you massively to, um, to look at it uh, constructively. Um, now, Londoners are getting slightly mixed signals on uh, drugs policing. Um, on the one hand, we've got these, you know, possibilities of a, of a diversion trial. On the other hand, we've recently seen sort of macho crackdown policing with videos on t police videos on Twitter um, showing police going around Shoreditch, stopping and swabbing people for drugs when they're going into clubs, which then had to have a sort of clarification issued afterwards. Now, I don't want to go into the details of that right now because all these are issues could be covered by your London Drugs Commission. Now, you said you would launch it... Are you, you know, in your manifesto last spring. But since then, even in the draft police and crime plan, there's no further detail about the Drugs Commission. So when are you going to publish details about the London Drugs Commission, and in particular, the terms of reference? So you'll be aware, a manifesto is written for an entire term. Uh, nobody expects all of them to be delivered in the first uh, six months. Uh, and obviously you'll appreciate we've been a bit distracted with the, uh, the uh, pandemic. I I'd be disappointed if I couldn't give you more news about the Drugs Commission over the next couple of months. Two months. Thank you very much, Mr Mayor. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. The next question concerns the rollout of zero emission buses in London, and that's from Assemblymember Pigeon. Oh, thank you, question. Uh, I'm committed to making London the greenest city in the world, moving to net zero by 2030. Transport has a big role to play in this, not least our bus fleet. I'm incredibly proud uh, that there are already over 600 zero-emission buses currently in the TfL fleet, including 20 double-decker hydrogen fuel buses, which I launched on Route 7 and 245 last year. This makes London's zero-emission bus fleet the largest in Western Europe. We're aiming to reach 800 zero-emission buses by the end of this financial year in March, uh, and a fully zero-emission bus fleet by 2030, depending on government funding. The buses we have in the fleet now are already helping to reduce TfL's carbon footprint, and further reduce harmful emissions, helping to ensure Londoners can breathe cleaner air. Hydrogen buses could play a key role for TfL's longer distance bus routes, for which battery electric buses currently lack the necessary range. In general, hydrogen buses and infrastructure remain more expensive than electric alternatives, but hydrogen could be more commercially and operationally competitive on these longer routes. TfL is still assessing the total lifetime costs of hydrogen buses based on the 20 double-decker buses that are in service. However, the higher upfront cost of these buses and support and infrastructure is a significant barrier to the wider deployment in London. While battery electric buses are expected to form the majority of the fleet, hydrogen fuel cell buses could still make a smaller but important contribution to London's zero emission bus fleet in the future if their costs can come down and TFL remains open to both technologies. The hydrogen fuel for TFL's fleet is currently produced as a byproduct from an industrial facility in Runcorn. But from 2023-24, TfL expects this to be replaced by truly zero-emission green hydrogen produced using wind power. As part of TfL's wider work to make buses greener, by January last year, all buses in its core fleet had been brought up to strict Euro 6 emission standards following a retrofitting programme and the replacement of older buses with new ones. Now completed, this will see harmful nitrogen emissions from TfL's 9,000-strong bus fleet fall by up to 90%. I'm committed to making all London's bus, uh, buses zero emission by 2034 at the latest. However, the right support from government, that date could be brought forward uh, to 2030, which has saved an additional 1 million tonnes of carbon. Hydrogen could make a vital contribution to meeting this goal. Thank you very much for your response. I appreciate hydrogen bus technology is in development, and I also understand TfL's financial difficulties. But um, you have invested £6 million in a hydrogen refuelling centre in Perryvale. So why is TfL still only running 20 hydrogen buses when you have made that investment? Because that's all the buses we have. Are you saying why don't we buy more buses? Yeah, why, why aren't you looking to expand the hydrogen yeah, buses, sorry. given you've made that investment? So, so the, 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 the investment we made was 
possible because of uh, EU funding. Uh, the EU gave us, uh, uh, I think, £6 million pounds towards the buses. We gave another £5 million. Pounds. The government gave us a £1 million. Pounds. That came to £12 million. Pounds. Without the European funding, we couldn't do it. And the second important part of the equation was we jointly procured with other cities across the country, the Aberdeens, the Birminghams, I think there were, there were a number of cities across the, the, the country. That joint procurement meant the cost came down a bit. Uh, if we did 20 each, it brings the cost uh, down. The upfront cost of hydrogen are, are more expensive than electric, so hydrogen bus, roughly speaking, costs about £600,000. Electric, uh, £400,000. That does prohibit going for hydrogen. But we'd want, to, we'd want to buy more if we had the money to do so. You'll remember the way electric buses work is the operators buy them rather than us. So it's a different model for hydrogen because we're keen to test these buses, particularly on double-decker routes. Lovely. And your manifesto has a specific commitment to increase connectivity in outer London through improved bus networks. As part of the work you're doing in this area, will you review how hydrogen buses could play a role in outer London, given their fast refuelling and their long range, which makes them ideal for those orbital routes? If you get a chance, you should go to one of the bus garages in Ealing. The, the, the speed of refuelling is quite impressive, um, and you're right, longer ranges. The issue we have is the garages having the equipment to do it uh, and, and having only 20 double-decker buses. Um, but we are looking into based upon what experience we have with these 20, whether for the longer routes, where, where an electric battery may not be as good, whether they'd be a good way forward. Uh, we're also going to experience other cities have as well. We can learn from each other. And so, um, you know, working where we can, uh, particularly when I explain we'll have green hydrogen very, very soon, which is really exciting. Lovely. Look forward to seeing that develop. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you. The next question it concerns standards in public life. And by that, that's by Assemblymember Duval. Thank you, Chair. Thank, thanks for your question. <clears throat> it's of the utmost importance that everyone in public life meets the highest standards of propriety now and every day of the year. Rules and laws must be followed by everyone. But people who are elected to public office have an additional responsibility to set the best example. Representing your community is a huge privilege. When Londoners see their elected representatives flouting the rules, it undermines public confidence in the democratic process. The COVID regulations impose significant restrictions on our most fundamental liberties to control the spread of the virus. This changed everyone's lives overnight. We didn't see our families for months. Some people weren't able to leave their homes. Young people had their educations disrupted. Many people lost their incomes. For some people, the regulations had consequences most of us can never imagine. They weren't able to attend their loved ones' funerals. People died alone. But we stuck to the rules because we knew it was the right thing to do. And now we know uh, that all the while, members of the party of the government were flouting the laws they themselves established. They were attending drinks parties and celebrations while Londoners did the right thing and stuck to the rules. They were laughing about it, and it feels like they were laughing at us. We've heard mealy-mouthed apologies from those who've been caught out. We might ask why these are only forthcoming when the photos or emails appear in the papers. The assembly member pictured at a party on the 14th of December 2020 stood down as chair of the Policing and Crime Committee on the 14th of December 2021, exactly a year later, and only when his picture appeared in a national newspaper. It's worth reflecting on this. He continued to chair the committee responsible for scrutinising the work of the Metropolitan Police for a full year after he broke a law established to protect us against a deadly pandemic. We've now seen him step down as chair of the Economy Committee and up until today vanish from this chamber. His resignation as an Assembly member must surely now be an inevitability. Londoners deserve much better representatives than that. Thank you, Mr Mayor, for the, the question. Of course there was, and there are comments about what's gone on in national government, and then there are issues relating to the conduct of members of this Assembly. 
Now, let's be honest. The monitoring officer has come to a view in response to an all-party response about those issues, and I think that needs to be followed up. And they've decided that the member is not going to be asked to be called to account because the activities occurred outside the, issue, uh, outside the GLA activities. I think that's questionable, and I think that needs to be reflected on and answered. But for today, let's be very clear. The conduct that the member was, it wasn't just... Assembly Member Duval, you're very well aware that the, the uh, job of this chamber is to question the mayor about Chair, his responsibilities. Chair, so just, I would just I'm about ask to get you to, a to question. I'm about continue to get to a question. that on that basis. I will, I will try to, to get to it, and I will get to it as quickly as I can. The conduct of us all as Assembly members isn't just a party political issue of one particular group. It reflects on us all. And in terms of following the rules and the guidance during a national emergency where there was loss of life and people asked to restrict their activities to protect others. Mr Mayor, would you not agree that if, you know, it is a matter for the Conservative group to carry out discipline for their own members, and no doubt they'll tell us what they've done or not done in that case. I understand Conservative colleagues in the Conservative office were disciplined for the party and the fragrant breach that took place. The individual could resign as a matter for him. We can't make that individual resign. But, Mr Mayor, do you not agree that he seemed to have apologised to Boris Johnson, I'm not sure what for, for being caught. He even apologised to his mum on, that, on, on national TV. But he needs to apologise to Londoners and he needs to apologise to his colleagues on this assembly. He needs to apologise to his colleagues in the Conservative group who've tried to uphold the rules of the law, and every one of us. Because what his actions have done, and in misleading the media, was he at the party or not, has brought us all into disrepute. And therefore, I do think an apology is owed to us, uh, uh, an apology is owed to Londoners. Mr that. Mayor, would you not agree that he should do the right thing and apologise to right, us in you. the first instance? Well, look, we, we, we've heard a carefully scripted apology from the Prime Minister, which I suspect is written by a member of a profession that the Prime Minister regularly criticises and chastises, and I've no doubt very shortly we'll be hearing a similarly scripted apology or non-apology from the said member, Ms. wedding -Sea Chair. I you, you complete assembly member on your I'm question. I just thought there might be an answer for an apology or uh, someone getting up and apologising. Assembly... But I, was, I just had a pause. In that sense, Mr Mayor, is it in terms of our conduct? Is the conduct, just going back to what we said earlier on, is it incumbent on us whether we are in doing GLA activities or not that we uphold the rules and the, and the laws of this country at all times that we don't mislead people about situations that we're in for over a year and mislead colleagues, mislead colleagues about what took place uh, without some calling to account. We've heard what the monitoring officer has said. Do you, do you not think the minimum that could be said is that an apology is required, a public apology is required to Londoners and it's best takes place in this chamber uh, while the opportunity is there? Well, I think... You you and I have knocked on enough doors and spoken to enough Londoners to understand that Londoners aren't stupid. And the problem Londoners have is they are seeing people in positions of power and influence blatantly breaking the rules uh, and laughing about it at the same time as they are lecturing us to follow the rules. Uh, and so it's not just the, the, the law breaking. Uh, it's not just the, the, the lies. It's the hypocrisy. And it's very difficult for you and I to go out tomorrow uh, and then ask Londoners to follow new rules, to follow the regulations, when there's been no comeuppance for those who have flagrantly broken the rules. And that's why it's so Thank important um, uh, in, in relation to the Prime Minister's conduct. And, and somebody who had circumstances been different could have been sitting in this chair as the mayor of this uh, great Thank city. And it's flabbergasting. And do you not think that silence, then, Mr Mayor, just shows the contempt that people hold for the public and for those Londoners who made those sacrifices and those who'd lost loved ones as well? 
do you not think the silence is uh, from coming from the right people in terms of can across, I, across okay. the table? Can I, can I ask, uh, this assembly has a specific function of holding the mayor to account. There are other ways of holding assembly members to account and it is not the function of this body. And I just want, and you assembly member Duval know more than any of us that that is what Chair, this body is for. So Chair, I would defense, just ask you to phrase Chair, your Chair, in my defense, questions. In my defense, the light to turn off the clock, in my defense, I'm asking about the conduct of assembly members in carrying out their business and the mayor's view of that. And I think I'm entitled to do that about holding him to account and about what we'd expect. At the same time, I think there are opportunities when members in this chamber should do the right thing, do the right thing before even being well, called to do it. Well, as long as you get the mayor's opinion on that and that's, that's what I'm seeking to do. Thank you. Uh, Assembly member Russell. Thank you, uh, Chair. Just briefly, I want to back up the points that Assemblymember Duval has made with my own words. In the midst of all this mess, it would be good if at least someone were to hold themselves to account in a way that is consistent with at least one of the Nolan principles of public life. And that for this to be a member of the Assembly would do us all credit. Do you agree, Mr Mayor? I do. Thank you. Um, the next question concerns a major incident in London following uh, Omicron, and that's in the name of Assembly Member Clark. Thank you, uh, Chair. Uh, following, th thank you, Chair. Uh, previous waves of the pandemic have shown that early and decisive action is key to limiting the spread of infection. And it was important to be proactive as the wave of Omicron surged through London in December. Declaring a major incident only brought Londoners responders together through a strategic coordinating group, but also highlighted the seriousness of the situation we faced everyone in our city. The SCG reviews whether it is still appropriate to have the major incident status in place at every meeting. It is meeting this morning and will be considering the implications of the government's decision to end Plan B measures. The SCG has brought together the emergency services, the NHS, local authorities with government colleagues, the UK Health Security Agency and the Office for Health Improvements. It enables services to cooperate and coordinate in an agile manner, sharing joint understanding of the risks to London as the situation with Omicron changes rapidly. It has allowed all agencies to share information on the impacts on their services as well as to identify interdependencies between them and the possible options for interagency support if needed. The key difference between the Omicron wave and previous variant waves is that significantly higher infection and potential absenteeism rates limited the options for interagency support, which made the sharing of situational awareness between the agencies even more important. Through invoking a major incident and reforming the L London SCG, we established direct and senior routes into central government policy teams and were able to engage directly on the policy changes that have been made nationally. With the declaration of a major incident underlining the seriousness of the situation, it also encouraged Londoners to take the personal action needed to protect our frontline services. Both the NHS and London Ambulance Service reported an immediate reduction in service pressures for the week following the announcement. This was a vital reduction in service demand that London needed at that time. Meanwhile, London has answered the call to get their booster and first and second dose vaccines and continue to do so. As always, London has supported each other and our emergency and frontline services throughout what was another difficult festive period. Many thanks, Mr. Mayor, and thank you uh, again for your support of our emergency services, and I'd like to thank them as well. I'm just wondering if, if you know what the current levels of staff absences are in frontline services and, and what challenges does that face at, at present? Sure. I, I've got data, Chair, that's a, a, a couple of days old because it, there, there is some lag between them giving us the data and so forth. So if, if you'll if you're, forgive me if they're, if they're a couple of days out, uh, out tune. So the NHS uh, absence rates uh, at Christmas was approaching 8%. 
It's now stabilised between 5 and 6 per cent. The London Fire Brigade absences uh, uh, was um, approaching 15 per cent uh, during Christmas, on Christmas Eve, uh, 6 per cent by mid-January. TfL uh, has reduced from 6 per cent to uh, about 4.4 per cent. The Met Police Service were at amber status for staffing. They've now returned to green rating, and we're talking about a reduction from about 13.5 uh, per cent to about 10 per cent. Uh, the key thing to make is this, the key point to make is this, aggregate figures don't really give you a true reflection of the picture, because you could have in certain parts of a, an organisation, it could be a control room or a, a department where you've got big numbers being absent, and that's why it's really important to look below the numbers, and that's why the um, major incident being declared and the greater cooperation and working meant we could sh share data in real time. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. And have you been able to share this, uh, this approach you've taken with, with other cities? Because I think it was important, especially ahead of, of the holidays, as we saw the rates going up, that you had taken that action early. Yeah, we have. And, and uh, just to see, you know, one of the advantages of declaring a major incident is we get to, plugged into central government's uh, thinking as well. I let not only me be able to speak to the Secretary for Health, uh, Sajid Javed, but also because we were a week or two ahead of the rest of the country, we could cascade our experience to the rest of the country. That's a really invaluable thing we've learned over the last 22 months, and it's a good example of, uh, of you know, London helping in a non-patronising way other parts of the country by our systems, which is really important. Excellent. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. The next question concerns the zero strikes promise, and that's from Assemblymember Devonish. Well, thank you, uh, Chair. I'm disappointed by the continuing night tube strike action by the RMT that is impacting our city's hard-hit retail cultural and hospitality sectors, as well as the nighttime economy, at a crucial time. The night chief has an important part to play in our capital's recovery and helps to improve safety for everyone making their way home at night time. Reopening of the night chief followed months of discussions and meetings with the RMT and the other recognised trade union on the proposals to combine the day and night tube train operator roles. The other trade union agreed to the proposals and since then TfL has repeatedly engaged with the RMT through the conciliation service ACAS on this issue. I'd urge the RMT to come back to the table and seek a resolution to this dispute. I'm pleased to say, though, that since night tube services resumed on Saturday, the 27th of November, TfL has been operating a near normal service on the Victoria Line and a reduced but regular service on the Central Line through Central London. It has been made clear throughout the dispute that no tube driver has lost their job because of these changes, nor will they. No driver has been forced to switch to part-time or full-time work if they don't want to. Any driver who wished to remain working solely in night tube services has been able to do so. Binding arbitration hands, binding, binding arbitration hands over important decisions to an external third party with limited knowledge of the organisation involved and its workforce. It does not allow the arbit arbitrator to come up with an alternative outcome which presents a significant risk to effective business management. Binding arbitration also removes the motivation for businesses to work with their staff to find positive solutions. There are good reasons why binding up pendulum arbitration is not in use in the UK, either with any of the privatised uh, train brain companies, any of the other transport authorities, or in other fields. The rights and obligations relating to industrial action are enshrined in national legislation. They're a matter for national government. It would make sense for fundamental employment rights to be different in different parts of the country, and it would create an uneven playing field that would not be right for everyone. I'm proud, Chair, that since I became Mayor, the number of days lost due to strike action has reduced by 72% compared to the previous Mayor's time in office. This is a result of constructive engagement with TfL staff and the trade unions, and this is an approach I intend to continue taking in London. Thank you, Mr Mayor. Well, you don't like the Conservative Group's plan on binding pending in arbitration. That's fair enough. You're the Mayor of London, sir. So what is your plan to stop the next six months of Londoners being inconvenienced by more tube strikes, please? Well, I wasn't aware uh, until uh, today that the Conservative group wanted us to have a system of arbitration that's used in, in places like Chile. Uh, uh, but, but we're not in favour of uh, that system. By the way, nor is the national government. Uh, maybe you should speak to them in relation to uh, binding pendulum arbitration. I'm quite clear the way to resolve disputes is to get around the table and resolve them. And I'd encourage uh, the RMT and TfL to get around ACAS. TfL is ready to talk to try and resolve these uh, differences. Ultimately, 
the way you resolve differences, not just in industrial relations, but in other forms of life, is by talking. And I'd encourage the RMT and TfL to get on the table and talk and resolve these. These can be resolved. Uh, there is a way through these, and it's in everyone's interest uh, for the disputes to be resolved. So you're confident that we won't face six months of disruption for Londoners recovering from COVID, trying to be socially distanced, because I've been on tubes during these days, and it's been it's back to the old sardines before COVID because there are less tube trains running. So are you confident that you, by talking, can resolve this in weeks rather than months, Mr Mayor? Well, hold on a sec. It's really important we clarify uh, this information. There, are, there, isn't, there aren't fewer trains running in the daytime. Uh, and as far as the night tube is concerned, I'm, I'm impressed to see using the night tube uh, on, on a Saturday and uh, early mornings of, of Sunday. Uh, the Victoria line is up and running to near normal uh, service. Uh, the Central line is running a, a decent service. Both those lines only came into existence since I became uh, mayor. We're, I'm really proud of those uh, night tubes. We have managed to reduce strike action since I've become mayor, and it's by talking. It's by treating trade unions with respect, by engaging with them, and by trying to address any issues they may have in a way that uh, ensures that we can provide a decent service. I'm hopeful uh, that uh, uh, the resolution of this dispute can be uh, reached, but it means talking. And I'd encourage the RMT to come back to ACAS and TfL to talk with RMT to see if we can resolve this amicably. It's in everyone's interest to do so. Well, I'm surprised with your answer about fewer trains because certainly there's been delays. I've personally experienced, and many people have been telling me, there are less trains. The trains are more crowded at certain times during these activities, these actions. But on terms of actually solving the problem, are you confident that we're not going to face six months more of strikes, please? Well, there's two issues you raise in your question. Firstly, it's, it's for the reason we're seeing people returning to our tubes that I'm trying to persuade the government to keep the national requirement to wear a face mask. And I'd hope he'd join me in trying to put pressure on the government to do what's in the interests of public safety rather than appeasing angry backbenchers. In Mr Mayor, to, we agree on that, but that's not my question. Well, 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 I'm glad you agree on this. What I'm asking you to do is to lobby your government to try and make them change your mind, because love as we do, you don't have the power to do Mr. so. Mr Mayor, you're the Mayor of London. Can we talk about your responsibilities just for once? It'll be absolutely wonderful. You said you were going to be a zero-strike mayor. You are not a zero-strike mayor. I'm asking you, can you actually get the unions to stop these strikes and not have another six months of strikes? It's a simple question. Well, I'll try again. So in relation to TfL, I'm astonished he doesn't see the link between national legislation and how TfL runs. Uh, and, and just like his colleague... I thought you were the mayor. Maybe I was wrong. Uh, uh, Assembly Member Devonish, could you allow the mayor to answer? Well, so th there is a link between national government policy, national government funding, and the way TfL is uh, run. And I'm sure he'll welcome the fact that since I've been mayor, there's been a 72% reduction in days lost through strike action. I like the previous... That's mayor, not true either. I mean, I mean for, any, for any students watching this, I mean, they, 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 they were not going to be impressed by this sort of behaviour. Uh, what... Can we... Chair, I'll leave it there. I'm not going to get anywhere. I'm wasting my colleague's time. You can ask other questions. He won't answer any questions. It's appalling. Thank you, Chair. The uh, next item uh, to be discussed concerns... Um, next question is Omicron and uh, the COVID-19 update and that comes from Assemblymember Dr Sahota who's joining us remotely. Thank you uh, Chair and thank you for your question Dr Sahota. Uh, I want to begin by thanking all our wonderful health and uh, care staff and your personal involvement in this uh, area and members of your family who've continued to work tirelessly throughout this uh, pandemic and to all Londoners who have made huge sacrifices to protect themselves their loved ones, their communities, and our frontline services. I know how angry they are by the behaviour of Sean Bailey that we saw in the newspapers uh, very uh, recently, and his failure to apologise even today when offered the chance to do so by Len Deval and by Caroline uh, Russell. Omicron has hit London hard, spreading rapidly, and we saw the highest case rates in England in the initial phases. The NHS and social care have never been under greater pressure with increased demand for services, staff, absences due to sickness or isolation on top of existing vacancy rates 
and long-term chronic underfunding. There are encouraging signs that COVID case rates are now plateauing. However, rates remain high following a peak at New Year and are anticipated to only reduce slowly. I continue to meet regularly with London's senior NHS and public health leaders and receive comprehensive briefings on the progression of the pandemic, the vaccination programme and the impact of COVID and Omicron on the health and care system. The NHS is closely monitoring the situation. The most important thing Londoners can do to protect themselves and their communities is to get vaccinated, whether it's a first, second or third dose. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor, for that answer. Uh, and, uh, and thank you for all the um, nice words you said about me and also about the NHS workers. I I'm sorry I couldn't join you personally at uh, the New City Hall because I have to go to a, a, a funeral at, mid at midday, so I want to explain this to you, but others I would love to have joined you in the New City Hall. Uh, but yesterday we saw the Prime Minister say that wearing of the masks isn't required by law in closed spaces and on TfL. And you had to put out a press statement saying that there's still a requirement of carriage on TfL uh, to, to wear a mask. So do you think the Prime Minister's decision was based upon a scientific, uh, some scientific basis or simply the fact that he may have been knocked out senseless by the knockabout he got in the House of Commons in the Prime Minister's question time? Yeah, I think it's a really important issue, important issue you raised. Look, all the evidence now is there in relation to the difference at face masks uh, where it makes. I recently read an article, I'm sure you did, uh, in, the, in the British Medical Journal, which had a comprehensive analysis of studies done in relation to um, face mask uh, wearing. And I think what it showed is a 53% less chance of catching the virus by wearing a uh, face mask. And this was international analysis, uh, actually one of the most effective, I think the most effective a non-pharmaceutical intervention is wearing a uh, face mask when you can't keep your social distance, uh, like on public uh, transport. It's astonishing. You've had a Conservative member today talking about uh, being packed like sardines in the tube, yet no mention of his Prime Minister uh, saying it's OK not to wear a face mask uh, in public uh, transport. And the reason for this can only be because we know, uh, for ideological reasons, there are members of the Conservative Party who sit in Parliament who uh, have a role in deciding whether this Prime Minister stays in work being against face mask wearing. So rather than choosing the uh, advice and experience of people like Dr Susan Hopkins, people he employs to chair uh, the uh, relevant agency and other medical experts he's chosen to side with his backbench MPs whose support he needs to stay in his job. And I worry about people who uh, may now catch the virus because people next to them aren't wearing a face mask and they may have the, they may have the virus and pass it on and not be symptomatic, or they themselves, because they're not wearing a face mask, may be more susceptible to catch it. Thank you for that, Mr Mayor. And we know that, of course, having the back of, back of legislation does increase the compliance of almost by 10 to 15 per cent of wild mask wearing. So I hope that everyone in the Assembly who can use their influence, either in the Labour Party and otherwise in the Tory Party, will use the influence to get the Prime Minister to... Uh, realise that the pandemic still isn't over. But the second issue, of course, is our school children who have really paid the price uh, of missing out on education and the education experiences due to, due to COVID. And so we want the schools to be functioning. Um, is the government doing enough right to get the right ventilation and the right uh, air, air, um, clean, air uh, the, uh, appliances for uh, cleaning the airs, right, and so the airways? Um, to in, in the schools, or can we do more to make sure the schools don't shut down um, as a result of the pandemic not being over at the moment? Look, can I just say, I had a meeting uh, last week with the uh, new health secretary, uh, and I was incredibly impressed with uh, Naeem Zawi's understanding, but also making sure there's delivery of the monitors and the ventilators across our uh, schools. Uh, what he's agreed to do is we're in regular contact now. If we hear reports from schools who are lacking the ventilators, uh, all the right monitors. Uh, he will rapidly respond to that particular school. We're in contact with the, uh, the, 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 the trade union, the, the schools across uh, the city. Uh, the Deputy Mayor, Joanne McCartney, uh, is making sure we, we have uh, you know, close contact with those schools. You will know, uh, as a parent, but also as a member of the Assembly, uh, the impact on child's education by a child missing school. We want to minimise 
uh, schools closing down, children being excluded and so forth. That's why it's so important to encourage children to take up the vaccine, uh, to wear a face mask uh, where, where they can't keep their uh, distance, but also to make sure any concerns around ventilation, around uh, you know, extraction of vans and so forth are, are addressed. And I'm far more confident with this Education Secretary than I was with the previous one. He really does appear to get it. And I think his experience working on a cross-party basis as the Vaccines Minister is a good sign for our city, and more importantly for our children uh, who need a decent education safe from this virus. Thank you, Mr Mayor. Thank you. Thank you. The next question concerns the Woolwich Ferry dispute, and that's from Assemblymember Prince. Thank you, Chair. I understand how important the Woolwich Ferry uh, is. It is a vital part of London's transport network, providing a much-needed free cross-river link for pedestrians, cyclists, cars, vans and lorries between Woolwich and North Woolwich, and is used by an estimated 2.6 million passengers annually. I was pleased when TfL took over the management contract for the ferry last year, so now runs the service as well as owning it. We made this change so we could bring a renewed focus on meeting customer need and improving reliability. It was apparent that there, has been, there had been significant industrial relation issues within the organisation. It was the right decision to bring the service back in-house, and I was glad to have the support of the Trade Union Unite in that decision. TFL wants to create a best-in-class service for the Woolwich Ferry in terms of safety standards, customer services, affordability, performance, reliability, and employee satisfaction. We want the Woolwich Ferry to meet Vision Zero safety principles and be a leader in the maritime sector. Since this dispute began, TFL has continually made itself available for discussions with Unite with the sole aim of reaching a resolution. TFL has made a number of offices, uh, beg your pardon, a number of offers, offers during this time in a bid to resolve the dispute, but regret, re regrettably, no agreement, no agreement has been reached. I met with the General Secretary of Unite in November to discuss the, union, the union's concerns, and follow-up meetings have been scheduled. TFL really are committed to resolving this dispute so we can keep pressing forward with improvements to the ferry service. TfL has a well-defined set of objectives for a safe, sustainable, successful and affordable Woolwich Ferry service, which they've shared with Unite. I believe agreement around these could provide the foundation for both resolving the current dispute and for the future of the ferry, and I hope going back to these principles can help move the discussions forward. TfL remains committed to the future safe and reliable operations of the Woolwich Ferry and to working with Unite to resolve the dispute. It's disappointing that the further talks that took place earlier this week have not been able to move things forward, and I'd urge Unite to come back to the negotiating table so a solution can be found. Thank you, Thank you Mr Mayor. As you know, this is a vital link in East London uh, until you get your Silvertown tunnel built, which uh, we welcome. Um, there are no, there's no way that lorries can get across, um, or the larger lorries can get across, or indeed that even a double-decker bus can't get across. Um, so will you uh, personally intervene, Mr. Mayor? I know you indicated that you um, may have had some talks, but it's, it really has been a bit of a shipwreck since TfL have taken over, which is regrettable because I think we all welcomed TfL taking over, to be honest. Um, so do you think you can personally intervene to ensure that the service gets back to normal and that we have the service that Londoners deserve? Yeah, thank you for the question, though you asked it, and, and I, I agree, I share your concerns. So, so the two points to make is, firstly, it's just worth reminding ourselves there were, there were historical industrial relations issues, uh, and this, this is the legacy of that. But secondly, uh, yes, uh, you know, I, I, I do intend to get more involved in trying to resolve this. I think there is a way forward. I think a lot of these issues are legacy issues, so they're not issues that have, that, that have come because of TfL. Uh, and we're going to do whatever we can because you're spot on for certain people uh, driving certain vehicles and that part of our city is crucial. Okay. We'll hold you to that, Mr Mayor. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. The next question concerns London's economy and that's by Assemblymember Ahmed. Thank you, Chair. The impact of the Omicron variant on London's economy this winter has been very severe. December was a huge disappointment for London's hospitality, retail, culture and leisure businesses with takings down significantly in the weeks leading up to Christmas compared to pre-pandemic levels. The number of people travelling into central London fell following the implementation of the government's Plan B guidance to work from home. Central London shopping and theatre districts like the West End saw a big drop of footfall compared to pre-pandemic levels, which continued into the new year. Today, we've published updated tourism forecasts showing that in the final quarter of last year's 
uh, final quarter of last year, domestic and international visitor nights to London were down 40% to the equivalent quarter in 2019, and spend related to those down by 60%. The latest survey by the London Chamber of Commerce and Industry shows that between the third and fourth quarters of 2021, there was a worsening in London's business confidence in the UK and the London economy and in their own company's prospects for the next 12 months. December takings are crucial for London's shops, restaurants, theatres, nightclubs and pubs, which rely on the income to keep them afloat in the leaner months that follow. After an extremely challenging and volatile 20 months, the loss of anticipated income will undoubtedly and dramatically impact businesses' ability and confidence in the first months of 2022. With COVID infection rates and hospital admissions having peaked in London, I hope the government's upcoming review of Plan B measures uh, will make the removal of some restrictions uh, possible become a, make a difference on the ground. Either way, our world-renowned re hospitality, retail, culture and leisure businesses still need further help. The package of measures announced by the Chancellor on the 21st of December did not provide the level of support required, which is disappointing after members of the London COVID Business Forum and I set out what was required to the government following our last meeting. I continue to urge the government to provide full business rates relief, extension of the VAT relief scheme and a more sustainable increase in direct grant funding to help, grant funding to help London's businesses this winter. Thank you, Mr Mayor. Mr Mayor, many Londoners receive low levels of sick pay that leads to them sadly having to go to work and then spreading the virus. Your good work standard supports employers in improving employment practice. Do you think that paying sick pay at the London living wage rate is, should be a condition of accreditation to the good work standard? And if not, could it be? So thank you for your question. So the good, the good work standard is leading to more and more uh, employers uh, being exemplars. Employers should, uh, where they can, enhance their sick leave uh, conditions. But the real issue isn't uh, those employees that can enhance them. The real issue is the government changing the levels of statutory sick pay. Uh, it currently exists at 96 pounds 35 uh, pence, uh, which simply isn't enough. If the government was to increase statutory sick pay to the London living wage level, that would mean uh, that uh, those people who should be at home uh, would be at home. Uh, and that's why it's important for them to uh, do so. Uh, we're going to continue to work with the Good Work Standard employers to see what they can do, but also so they can speak to other employers who aren't quite doing that to see how they did it so they can share best practice. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. The, next... the next question concerns uh, the 533 bus route, and that comes from Assembly Member Rogers. Thank you, Chair. The 533 is a temporary route operation between Hammersmith bus station on the north side of the river and Castle now on the south side of the river via Chiswick Bridge and Barnes. It was introduced in 2019 following uh, Hamsworth and Fulham Council's decision to close Hamsworth Bridge to vehicular traffic. The bridge remains closed to motorised vehicles but is now open to people walking and cycling. The 533 provides an accessible connection between Hamsworth and Castle now. The route maintains step free access to the tube in Hammersmith ensuring there is a direct connection for those passengers who cannot easily walk or cycle across the bridge. The contract for the service has been extended for six months from the 15th of Jan to the 15th of July 2022. During this time, Route 533 will operate at a frequency of four buses per hour during hours of service every day of the week. The route continues to run non-stop between Hounsworth Bridge Road and Mortal Lake Cemetery in both directions. This maintains sufficient capacity for passengers who wish to travel across the river and ensures that the service is more reliable than if it were stopping more frequently. If the 533 were to stop along this section of the route, buses would be liable to become too crowded with short distance passengers from Hamsworth and Chiswick Bridge. This could reduce the available capacity for passengers who wish to travel across the river, which is of course the purpose of this bus route. Route 190 will continue to serve all bus stops between Hounsworth and Mortlake Lake Cemetery. Passengers wishing to travel to and from stops between Hounsworth and Chiswick Bridge can continue to use buses en route 190. Demand has understandably fallen on the 533 since uh, the bridge reopened to people walking and cycling in July last year. The current frequency matches capacity to, to demand at the busiest time of day and in the busiest locations. Later this year, 
TfL is planning to conduct a review of the bus network in the Barnes and Mortlake area based on comprehensive up-to-date passenger data to assess whether the local bus network remains suitable. TfL will continue to closely monitor passenger usage and reliability on this route. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. And just by starting off, I know the 533 is very much appreciated by residents in southwest London um, as a temporary measure whilst Hammersmith Bridge is closed. But uh, I do want to focus on the removal of those local stops in Chiswick that you, uh, that you touched on in your, in your answer. Um, I've had an awful lot of correspondence about this from uh, residents in Chiswick who, uh, who liked those stops, who found them convenient. There were hundreds of people who signed a petition calling on TfL to reinstate the stops. And I have to admit that the reasons for those stops being removed has changed um, since uh, I've started to take up this issue back in sort of June or July. Um, at first, I was told that the bus was too, too full. Um, by November, it had become that the bus was too empty to justify um, putting the stops on. So the bus is both too full and too empty. It's kind of like Schrodinger's bus here. Um, what, what's the actual reason? Is it that it's too full or is it that it was, there's now n not enough passengers to justify those local stops? Yeah, firstly, thank you for your interest in this matter. It is really, a really important bus and, and I'm really grateful you're raising this issue. Uh, I, I've, not, I've not heard the not too full uh, answer you gave. I've only heard the too full answer. Uh, and and the, the bus, not just not only does it slow down, but it gets too full for those who really need to be getting from one side to the other. That was the purpose of, of this bus. You'll be aware there are other buses that do stop uh, frequently. To reassure you, uh, and as importantly, your constituents, there are, in, there are real time reviews that take place. So we know every day how many people are using the bus. Uh, and also, there will be a further comprehensive review later on this year. Uh, I've seen your correspondence with the Deputy Mayor, and I'm grateful for you for keeping this at the fore of our mind because we've got to recognise, for the reasons you know better than I do, that bridge being closed to vehicles is causing a real nuisance to your constituents. So whatever we can do to alleviate that is the reason why we, we did the 53, which is basically to get people from one side of, of your patch, patch to the other uh, in the absence of a bridge. No, I, I absolutely understand that. Um, but I think one of the, at the heart of this issue really is engagement. It's about engagement with the community. And uh, on Monday... Uh, at his confirmation hearing, um, your new Deputy Mayor for Transport um, told me that he thinks it's essential to engage with local residents, and I, I absolutely agree with him. Um, so many local residents in Chiswick appreciated those stops in the 533, and I'm sure you'll be aware there's, there's quite a sensitive discussion at the moment in that part of London about transport and public transport um, and getting people out of their cars, uh, which is something we want to encourage. Um, they very much would like those, reinst those stops reinstated. Uh, and they feel that TfL made a mistake in withdrawing them. So uh, my request to you would be, perhaps through Seb Dance, whether you could meet uh, or Seb could meet with some of those residents so they could outline their position and perhaps um, uh, ask if TfL could reconsider. Let me be frank. I'm well aware that you know that patch far better than I do, but also that the briefing I have is written by people who may not know it as well as you do either. So although my briefing says there are very good reasons, why the 533 can't stop at all stops on the route. I, I respect your uh, knowledge of the area. Can I uh, instruct my deputy mayor to meet with you, uh, see if there's a way through this in relation to meeting the wishes of your constituents, but also you make a powerful point. I, I can't on the one hand encourage them to leave their cars at home. And on the other hand, where there is a bus uh, uh, and there's a potential way of helping your constituents not drive their cars, not do what I can to help. So, uh, ignoring my civil servant's uh, uh, advice, can I suggest, Chair, the Deputy Mayor of Transport Transport meets with uh, Nick, uh, Nicholas and, and sees if there's a solution to try and address the, the very good points you're raising to me now that I'm just, I'm just not on top of like you are. That's fine. Thank you very much. appreciate that. Thank you, Mr Mayor. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. And that's a commitment by the Mayor which this body logs. Thank you. Uh, the next question is TfL's Extraordinary Funding and Financing Agreement and that comes from Assemblymember Baker. Thank you, uh, Chair. Uh, having again taken us to the last day of the previous funding agreement in December, the government extended TfL's funding support until the 4th of Feb. Uh, we have no certainty of what will happen after that. As I've said before, without adequate funding, TfL will have to move to a managed decline scenario, meaning severe guts to services and capital investment. The pandemic is the only reason TfL is facing a financial crisis. These short-term deals are trapping TfL on life support rather than putting it on a path to long-term sustainability. 
Rather than supporting the capital city, the government is forcing us to raise additional revenue through measures like council tax, punishing Londoners for doing the right thing and avoiding public transport during the pandemic, as the government told them to do. The government must realise that London is the motor of the UK economy and TfL has a critical role to play in driving the national economic recovery. London contributes more than £36 billion in net to the Treasury each year. TfL contracts contribute £7 billion to the UK economy and supports 43,000 jobs around the country. We need their skills and expertise. The lack of funding from government means thousands of jobs are at risk here in London and across the country. Building London buses supports 3,000 skilled green jobs at factories in Scarborough, Falkirk, Leeds and Ballymena, for example. We can't do this ourselves. TfL has, to pause. TfL has had to pause awarding new bus contracts since early November, and London bus operators only place vehicle orders when new contracts have been awarded, meaning the lack of a long-term funding deal is having an immediate impact on the order books for, US bus for UK bus manufacturers. London Underground Renewals support jobs across the country. Siemens, for example, has committed to building a new train manufacturing facility at Gould in Yorkshire, a £200 million investment that will create 700 direct and 1,700 indirect jobs. I have therefore called again on ministers to stop playing politics with an issue of such great national importance and to start working with us in good faith so that we can agree a long-term funding deal that will protect London's transport network for the sake of the capital and the whole country. Thank you, Mr Mayor. Uh, firstly, I'd like to um, follow up with a question about a specific area of your transport strategy and how, how funding might affect that. We heard at Transport Committee last week about the threat to Vision Zero if, if uh, TfL funding cannot be secured, which would mean no additional safer junction schemes or transformational road safety schemes other than those that are planned at the moment. Can you tell us more about how funding uncertainty will affect road safety in the capital? So we've made good progress, uh, you know, I, I want to go even, fa even faster <clears throat> in relation to making our roads safer, in particular for cyclists and uh, pedestrians. One of the reasons why we're increasing capacity uh, in relation to Met Police enforcement is to try and make our roads uh, safer. Because we are on a managed decline scenario, uh, because uh, there's no certainty of uh, funding, we're having to pause uh, certain pieces of uh, work, some have so advanced we can't pause them, doesn't make sense. But also we can't look at new uh, schemes. You'll be aware that road dangers uh, evolve. New dangers we discovered today that weren't around six months ago. Uh, some of the schemes we're working on, the safer junction schemes, weren't, weren't known a number of years ago. They are known, we took action. So there's, there's a number of issues. Uh, those that we're currently trying to fix and sort out that we know about may not happen that may happen slower, but also uh, new threats can't be dealt with. And the other point is this, you'll be aware most of the roads are owned and controlled by councils. We give the councils funding for them to make improvements. We won't be able to do that either, and councils haven't got the money themselves to make these improvements. And again, final point, we're trying to encourage people to leave their cars at home, not use petrol and diesel, and to walk and cycle and use public transport. The government's making that really difficult with the way it's treating TfL. Thank you. Thank you for that update. Um, and just following up on that, um, as we know, TfL will be forced under a managed decline scenario to cut the number of tube and bus services if sufficient funding isn't forthcoming. Is the government's perceived lack of support for public transport, which would result in this, um, these, these service cuts, eroding the public's faith in the future of public transport? And, and what might be the impact on, on both car usage, as you said, or, or and revenue from, from fares? Well, there's a more basic point. Let's, let's, let's talk about today. From today, the working from home advice changes. Are you going to be encouraged and enticed to come back to the office if, you, you're, you know, if, you're, if there's 10% for your buses or 20% for your tubes? Or, or you, know, you, you can't get the quality of service that you've been used to. We need people to return to the office because that helps our economy, uh, or helps mentoring, helps creativity, and, and so forth. In the medium to long term, how are we going to have modal shift if there isn't good, attractive alternatives, accessible, safe, um, uh, uh, and affordable. And that's why it's so important for us to persuade the government that actually it appears the left hand doesn't know what the right hand's doing because the government's own you know, zero carbon strategy would encourage you to thought the DFT to give us the support we need. And that's why we're trying to, before the 4th of February, 
try and make them understand it's in the country's interest to give TfL the funding that we so desperately need, only needed because of the pandemic. Thank you. The next question concerns dogs on the streets and the ULES, and um, it's now being asked by Assemblymember Hall. Thank you, uh, Chair. The ultra-low emission zone is helping to clean up London's toxic air. In the uh, uh, first month of the operation of the extension, compliance with the emission standards in the expanded zone was as high as 92%, with around 47,000 fewer older, more pollution vehicles seen each day on average. Since 2017, more than four and a half years ago, there has been a wide reaching awareness raising campaign to ensure drivers were ready for the ULES and ES expansion. Over a million letters were sent to owners of non-compliant vehicles seen inside the zone ahead of expansion last year, with TfL's online vehicle checker being used more than 20 million times. I'm very grateful for the vital work all charities play in our communities, and I applaud the work of dogs on the streets in supporting rough sleepers by helping care for the pets that provide them emotional support and companionship. I'm aware that dogs on the streets has raised issues with the expanded ULES, and TFL has been in regular contact with the charity to help them identify the best option for them. Most recently, my Deputy Mayor for Environment and Energy and senior TFL officers met with them in December to discuss this matter and reiterate our previous offer of support. The charity's vehicles are light, good vehicles for which there is no exemption. However, TFL did offer funding from our successful scrappage scheme when it was open to all eligible charities operating non-compliant vehicles. TFL officers also proposed retrofit solutions and offered support to the charity while they arranged for the vehicles to be retrofitted. People who have booked a retrofit can benefit from a generous grace period from ULES charges to allow time to complete the retrofit. Unfortunately, dogs on the streets have said they do not wish to take these options, despite offers from officers to help source funding that may contribute to the cost of retrofit or replacement vehicles. Many excellent charities have taken up offers from TfL and found ways to comply with the ULES. I'm sorry that a resolution hasn't been agreed with dogs on the streets. It's vital, however, that we continue to clean up London's filthy air to protect the health of all Londoners, including rough sleepers, who are twice as likely to suffer from chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, or asthma, and 20 times more likely to suffer from tuberculosis. TFL remain open to working with dogs on the streets to support its transition to cleaner, less polluting vehicles so it can continue to deliver its valuable services. Uh, thank you, Mr Mayor. For anybody that isn't aware of how wonderful this particular charity is, um, you did actually say last time they did brilliant work. Um, they not only help homeless people, they also support victims of domestic violence and looking after dogs when someone is arrested or sectioned. Um, you agreed to the meeting at the last uh, Mayor's question time, I think it was, Mr Mayor, um, and I think they assumed that that would be of some help. But at the meeting, we have been told that they were offered nothing. They would love to upgrade their vans to be compliant, but it is just too expensive. They're in effect stuck like a pincer between one off cost of upgrading and the constant daily charge. And some charities literally live hand to mouth, as you well know. So if you go on the website, the scrappage schemes are uh, empty. There's no money there. Uh, could you have perhaps offered them a temporary two year exemption as you have already given to charities with minibuses? Um, Funding support would be much appreciated because um, they do an awful lot of work for the police, London ambulance, domestic violence, shelters, etc. And don't you agree that it's a false economy if for the sake of small sums, this brilliant charity, brilliant and you've accepted that they are very good, it would be shocking if they folded. Um, the knock-on costs of uh, other services would be far greater, I would suggest. This isn't what the ULES was intended to do. So can you think of any other support that City Hall could actually properly offer them? Thank you, Chairman. I've, I've, I've placed on record my thanks to this excellent uh, charity, and there are many other 
excellent charities who have made the transition to compliant vehicles and taken advantage of some of the uh, schemes that we uh, have. In the meeting the Deputy Mayor and TFL had with the charity uh, in December, as a consequence of the last uh, Mayor's uh, question time, these schemes were put to uh, the charity who declined uh, those uh, schemes. And you'll be aware, in addition to this brilliant charity working with uh, Rough Sleepers, there are many other brilliant charities working with Rough Sleepers, working with animals, working with young people, who also had polluting vehicles and have made their vehicles compliant uh, as a consequence of either the scrappage scheme or the generosity of the uh, public. Those schemes we talked about, TfL officers and the Deputy Mayor, are more than happy to discuss with the uh, charity. My understanding is uh, the charity has said no to offers of help on those uh, schemes. In relation to the minibus point, uh, which is different to the vehicles used by uh, dogs on the streets, I think the reason why the exemption applied to the minibuses, uh, the charity minibuses, was because of the lack of alternatives. In this particular case, there are cheap alternatives which TfL can advise the charity on if they're not aware of, which can give them a solution, which means they would be able to both continue to provide a fantastic service that they're providing at the same time as being ULS compliant. Yes, of course, these are warm words, but they actually don't help dogs on the street. We have been telling you for months and months that more money needs to be put into these scrappage schemes, not only for dogs in the streets. There are so many people out there that simply cannot afford to replace their vehicles. The scrappage schemes have no more money left in them. We've shown you where you can take the money to put into those scrappage schemes to help poorer Londoners, to help some of these fantastic charities, but you, you, you just go deaf at that point. Will you not look at ways that you can put more money into the scrappage schemes to help people like people that run dogs, um, dogs in the streets and also for poor people that just simply cannot afford to replace their vehicles? Well, the scrappage scheme was offered uh, to this charity who have declined it, so more money in the scrappage scheme would have made no difference to this particular charity. But we ourselves, TfL uh, uh, and City Hall, uh, found £61 million for our scrappage scheme. Uh, zero assistance from the government. And what we said to the government is if they gave us, more, if they gave us any money uh, towards a scrappage scheme, towards exemptions or discounts, we could be helping uh, the sort of people you claim to be wanting to help. I'd remind you uh, that uh, other cities have got assistance from the government, ranging from Birmingham to Portsmouth, uh, Bath to Manchester. We haven't. We'll continue to try and get more assistance for uh, London so we can be helping uh, small businesses, charities and families who could do with some financial assistance in making that transition. I'd also make the point, which is a really important point, which is uh, poor air quality causes the most problems to those Londoners least likely to own a vehicle. Half Londoners, almost half Londoners don't own a car. In the expanded area, uh, more than six out of ten Londoners don't own a car, and it's them who suffer the worst consequences yeah. of the toxic air in our city. Do you know, I really thought we were going to get through one question without you blaming the government or saying the government needs to give you more money. It's quite shocking, Mr Mayor. You're not answering half my colleagues. You need to be answering questions. All of these questions are put to you on things that you are responsible for. You never take responsibility for anything, and it's about time you did. Will you be prepared to give dogs on the streets an exemption for paying the ULES? Yes or no? Well, let me do with the first part of that no, question. No, here we go. Uh, uh, which the is, government think, again, no doubt. Which is, we are the most centralised uh, democracy in the Western world, and I want to apologise for trying to uh, get more powers and resources for our city. I'd remind uh, you that because of our lobbying, for example, the government devolved a further £320 million towards adult education. Because of the lobbying, Anne Clark referred to this in relation to the government around cladding, we managed to persuade the government to add an initial £27 million, but also persuade the government to follow our idea of getting developers to pay for cladding remediation. I can give other examples where we've persuaded the government to partially refund the police officers we lost. 20,000 replaced 21,000, but it's 20,000 we otherwise wouldn't have, but for our uh, lobbying. Similarly, in relation to air quality, uh, we're going to continue to lobby the government in relation to the monies we Thank need you, to get to zero carbon. Uh, the government agrees with our uh, 
at Where's ends, that? which is zero carbon. We need to lobby them to get to the uh, means, yep. which Mayor. is more support, more powers and more Mr funding. Mayor, lobbying is one thing. Going on like a, a, a demented parrot is not. All you ever do is go on about the government. I've finished now Thank because you. he's not answering my question. Thank you. Uh, that sounds about the right time for us. Uh, Five-minute recess. Um, we'll be back in uh, 11.50. Thank you very much.
Thank you, members. Um, we now move to the next question on the order of business, which concerns waste and food waste over Christmas, and that is in the name of Assembly Member Cooper. Thank you, uh, Chair. Uh, Re London is a statutory body of the Mayor of London and London's boroughs, to which I appoint the Chair. It plays a vital role in improving waste and resource management and supporting the transition to a circular economy across the capital. Reducing waste, especially food waste, is an important part of helping to achieve a net zero carbon London by 2030. Through the London Recycles campaign, ReLondon targeted advertising throughout December at residents of the 19 boroughs with the lowest recycling rates. This gave advice on reducing waste and recycling food, paper, card and Christmas trees and provided sustainable gift ideas. The campaign was delivered through a variety of outputs to maximise the reach, including ad bikes cycling in high footfall areas, animated YouTube adverts and content on Facebook, Instagram and Twitter, designed to reach over one million Londoners. ReLondon also promoted advice on Christmas-related waste topics throughout, through broadcast media. ITV, for example, carried four news segments in December covering advice on recycling over Christmas. ReLondon has also released a series of videos to highlight the impact of COVID-19 and HGV driver shortages on recycling collections across the capital. These asked Londoners to continue recycling, be patient with collections and reduce their waste to ease the burden on frontline services. This advice was also provided in a toolkit to all of London's boroughs for use in their own local messaging. I supported this work from City Hall by running a social media campaign, Go Green This Christmas, to raise awareness of this issue. Information was provided prominently on the GLA website to give tips for Londoners on how to make their Christmas more sustainable. 
Finally, with support from my Green New Deal fund, Re London has provided financial and advisory support to the Felix Project, London's largest food redistribution charity, which does fantastic work tackling food waste and food poverty. In December alone, the Felix Project rescued over 1,200 tonnes of surplus food to provide 3 million meals to vulnerable Londoners. Um, thank you very much, Mr Mayor. And, um, clearly, this is an area where there is still uh, much to do. Uh, very valuable work that will help with um, addressing the uh, climate emergency. Um, you ended there by talking about food waste. And as you know, food waste makes up about 26% of London's household weight waste, which is about 780,000 tonnes altogether, if all of that food waste was separately collected it would, uh, and sent for anaerobic digestion, it would save about 375,000 tonnes of CO2, um, equivalent emissions every mm. year. Um, and I know that uh, your team uh, has been agreeing uh, reduction and uh, recycling um, plans with all the boroughs, but we still have nine boroughs that are not separating out food waste. Um, is there anything more that can be done to persuade those boroughs towards that? I know the government is actually is stepping up on this now and talking about 2024, but can we move any faster because this is such an important area? Yes, yeah, it's, it's a real problem. But by the way, thank you for your advocacy on this really important issue, but also your, your education that you do to Londoners by, by talking about this and what we can do to, to, to reduce particularly food waste. So look, there is some good news. Uh, and you're right in relation to the plans we've had. Uh, as, so we now have you know, 28 boroughs now have uh, separate food waste collections or are undertaking trials and pilots, which is progress. Uh, the borough we both live in has been slow to join the policy, but it's now talking about and is doing uh, pilots and trials. The five remaining boroughs where there isn't even a trial or a pilot, uh, four of them uh, are part of a They've got a long-term contract that doesn't end until 2027, so it's a bit more challenging. The other one is Barnet, uh, who had previously committed to reintroduce food waste collection by April 2022, but they're, they're now seeking to delay this. And so we're going to continue conversations with them. What we really need is Londoners to put pressure on their councils, people power, uh, to rephrase a quote from a famous Tooting boy, uh, not me, uh, Citizen Morphy Smith, is what we need. Uh, London has put pressure on their councils to do much, much more for the reasons that you, you know well. I mean, I think it's really important that we all do, because I know that we quite a, talk quite a lot about um, the number of incinerators in London and also the, um, the, you know, the potential for increasing incinerators. And it's been very disappointing, and I know you wrote to government um, about the increase in incineration at, at Belvedere. Um, that, you know, but the only way to really persuade people that we don't need more incinerators because the figures at the moment used for, for the DCO, um, which came from government to agree that uh, additional incinerator, is because we're still not doing enough to reduce food waste. Well, one of the things that would necessitate councils doing more is if they had to because there wasn't capacity to, to, to burn the stuff or to, you know, or, or landfill. And so it's a chicken and egg. If councils think there's more capacity, so they don't need to make more progress on food, you know, they will do that. And that's why we really need a, a sort of pincer movement from the government and from uh, Londoners and ourselves to put pressure on the councils. Look, some, look councils have, have difficult financial challenges uh, and there may be some who may, may need to renegotiate their contracts and stuff, but I think we need, to, we need councils to understand that we support them having responsibility for you know, refuse and waste. I, mean, I, don't, I don't want powers taken away from them. Devolution should mean powers going down. But you should bring with it a responsibility to do, to do more because you've highlighted the figures, uh, that sort of carbon tonnes lost that otherwise doesn't need to be lost if there was less food waste. Well, I wanted to also ask you some more about what we could do in terms of the logistical supply chain, because there's also an awful lot of food that gets um, thrown away. 836,000 tonnes of imported food is lost or thrown away before it reaches London. Um, but I've run out of time, so I'm not going to be able to ask you on that one. Sorry. But, uh, thank you very much, uh, Chair. Thank you. Uh, the next question concerns the London Fire Brigade ca capacity, and that's in the name of Assembly Member Hall. Thank you, Chair. Could, could I begin by thanking you for your advocacy for our Blue Light Services uh, ever since I've been Mayor, and I'm really grateful for that, and I'm sure they are as well, and Londoners are as well. The London Fire Brigade has been on the front line throughout the COVID-19 response. Like all other emergency services, it faced staffing challenges during earlier waves of the pandemic, and again more recently due to the spread of the Omicron variant. Those challenges were an important factor in my decision to declare a major incident on the 8th of December. 
This enabled us to set up coordination arrangements between key public services through the re-establishment of the strategic coordinating group to address the pressures facing the city. The Christmas period that just passed was a challenging one for the London Fire Brigade, with significant numbers of staff off work due to COVID-19. This led to lower numbers of appliances being available for service. On Christmas Day, London Fire Brigade had 50 pumps off the run. However, this did not impact the emergency cover that was provided to Londoners across the capital. I can confirm that the brigade has consistently met its attendance targets throughout the pandemic to get the first fire engine to an incident within a London-wide average of six minutes and a second fire engine within a London-wide average of eight minutes. This did not change over the Christmas period. Since the start of the pandemic, the brigade has actively monitored the situation through its COVID-19 working group and the Brigade Coordination Centre. Rigorous planning was undertaken before Christmas to prepare for the impact of possible staff shortages. Current and predicted sickness levels were scrutinised and plans prepared to ensure the LFB maintained as many operational resources as possible. This included moving resources and postponing training were necessary to maximise the number of, of operational staff available to crew fire appliances. The Brigade Coordination Centre ensured that officers were briefed to make dynamic, proactive and reactive decisions on what activities and training to reduce in order to maximise the availability of resources on a day-to-day -day basis. The LFB, LFB also worked closely with the Fire Brigade's union to promote the use of pre-arranged overtime. My Deputy Mayor for Fire and Resilience and I uh, continue to speak on a regular basis with the Fire Commissioner about the ongoing impact of the pandemic to ensure that London has the emergency cover it needs. There are now early signs that staff numbers are improving and we hope to see this continue. I want to take this opportunity, Chair, to thank the LFB and all the Blue Light Services and other key workers for their work during the holiday period, particularly with the significant challenges provided by Omicron. Thank you, and I'm sure we'd all echo those thanks, uh, Mr Mayor. Um, I was particularly concerned when I saw the press release from the Fire Brigade Union stating that there were so many off on Christmas Day in particular. Are you confident that the London Fire Brigade has the capacity to deliver currently? The reason why, Chair, I really welcome your question and what the, the issue you've just raised now is just to give you an idea of the numbers. Uh, so this Christmas, 413 staff off. Last Christmas, 2020, 159. That's why your question is so pertinent. I am confident because uh, what the Commissioner with the FBU and others are doing is planning for that eventuality. One of the reasons we were keen to declare a major incident after I consulted with the Blue Light Services and others was because of staff absences. The good news is because most of our staff uh, had the, had the, um, the vaccines, they, the consequences weren't as serious, back to work pretty quickly, uh, but also the, the teamwork from the LFB was really good, cancelling some of the non-urgent training pre-arranged over time and the good news you'll be pleased to know is that even though 35 percent of our pumps were off um quality of service stayed good and that's a good example of good leadership on this occasion yes it, it is indeed and all my questions are pertinent mr mayor by the way <laughs> just so as you know you may well say that susan i couldn't possibly comment no you could try uh, you could try and answer them, Mr Mayor. That would really make my day. You could day. try and ask a decent question. Uh, well, y your, I your idea of decent and mine are obviously not I think you agree more with Boris Johnson than I do about decency. Uh, oh, oh, there you go. Again. Again. Uh, are we at the stage, do you think, where the London Fire Brigade should start to look at the amount of support that they're still giving to the London Ambulance Service? They've, st they've, st they've, they've stopped for, for reasons um, that were rehearsed uh, on, the, I think, 2nd of December is, is when they, they, they stopped. By the way, we should thank those 500 firefighters who really did help out the ambulance service at a time of their uh, need. But for good reasons, the, the fire brigade couldn't carry on that, that fund. I think it's Operation Braidwood. Uh, the LFB continue to talk to LAS to see where there is uh, mutual help that we can give, as indeed do the uh, MPS, but clearly... What the commissioner has got to do is to make sure he can look after his own, mm. the, the responsibilities he has, because uh, what he can't do is, is jeopardise that by, by trying to, with the best of intentions. And so, just to reassure you, although there's better teamwork, in, and you rightly, as chair of the uh, Budget and Performance Committee, ask for greater collaboration, that shouldn't, though, jeopardise the core business each one of those uh, blue lights does. And, uh, and the reassurance I've had, uh, which, which you'll have at, at the relevant time from the commissioner, is none of the work the LFB does is compromised by the teamwork. 
uh, but they'll always look for ways to save resources, work together, learn yeah. from each other and so forth. And we should continue that. Thank you, Mr Mayor. Thank you. The next uh, question concerns the fire risks posed by e-scooters. And that comes from Assemblymember Bakari. Thank you. Uh, whilst e-scooters have the potential to provide Londoners with a new form of transport that can reduce road congestion and make London a greener city, private e-scooters remain illegal on our roads, cycle lanes and footways. In London, Tierville is currently undertaking the UK's largest trial of e-scooters, using scooters that are subject to rigorous safety measures. This is the only legal way of riding e-scooters in public in our city. TfL is carefully assessing the impacts of the trial to ensure this new way of travelling is inclusive of everyone's needs and is safe for Londoners. Over the past year, the London Fire Brigade has seen an increase in the number of fires it has attended involving lithium-ion batteries associated with what they class as electrically powered personal vehicles, or EPPVs, as many as 70 in a 12-month period. The LFB has issued safety advice over the safe use of lithium-ion batteries following these incidents, and there is also information available on the Brigade's website to advise people on how best to keep themselves safe. Following an incident in November last year involving a folded, privately-owned e-scooter catching fire on a London underground train at Parsons Green Station, TfL launched an urgent review into the use of e-scooters on London's transport network. The review was supported by evidence from the London Fire Brigade's fire safety experts. As a result of the review, TfL announced a ban on all privately owned e-scooters on its network, which came into force on the, on the 13th of December 2021. The decision was fully supported by the London Fire Brigade. Many Londoners will be unaware when they think about buying an e-scooter that it's not legal to ride them anywhere in the public realm. So in the run-up to Christmas, the Met Police Service and my Walking and Cycling Commissioner, Will Norman, wrote to retailers reminding them of their responsibility to make customers aware of the legal status of private e-scooters and their use in public spaces. This issue is a good example of GLA functional bodies working together to identify concerns and take action to help keep Londoners safe. The London Fire Brigade Fire Safety Team is continuing to review the fire risk posed by private e-scooters as more information becomes available. Thank you. Now, there's growing evidence that e-scooters are not just posing a significant fire risk on roads and pavement, but also in our homes. Now, last year, the London Fire Brigade attended 50 fires involving e-scooters and e-bikes. Last week, we saw a fire in Wilsdon caused by a charging e-scooter, which resulted in a small bedroom flat um, being destroyed. Now, will you work with the London Fire Brigade to ensure a section on e-scooters is included on the electrical safety section of the website and that it's promoted through your channels? Well, Chair, I've not recently gone to the electrical section of the LFB website. Uh, but I will promise to do so, and uh, I think she makes a really good idea. Why, why don't I ask uh, my Deputy Mayor to speak to uh, Hina to see what other advice she's got, because this is an area we could be working together, because it's about public education, and, and you've got a lot of constituents who you know, respect what you say, and you can help us in relation to being a message carrier, so let's do that. Absolutely. So I, I also, uh, um, I, you know, would think that it would be helpful to have a wider publicity campaign around fire risk posed by e-scooters, not least uh, because the building safety scandal has un unearthed hundreds of residential buildings in London with serious fire safety defects, uh, which make the risks posed even more worrying. So as the mayor, will you be working together with boroughs, the LFB? housing associations on a publicity campaign to highlight the serious risk posed, emphasising not only the importance of fire, of, of safety around batteries. Chair, sure. the member raises raise a really important point, and as she's speaking, I've been, it just occurred to me the potential opportunities to get into people's homes with information that may help them, may keep them safer, because they may have an e-scooter in their home, not realise uh, the danger it poses. So, Chair, let me take that away. Uh, we're doing great work as the GLA family question. Are we doing enough with the housing associations, the smaller ones and the bigger ones? Uh, we are doing good work with the councils. But, but let me go in and just kick the tyres, see what more we can be doing. Uh, why don't I also ask um, uh, Deputy Mayor's uh, Tom Copley, uh, Fiona Twycross, um, and the relevant GLA ones, just to touch base with the member, if there's any idea, any other ideas she's got about those Londoners that we've historically found it difficult to reach, how we can mm. reach them. Some of them may on an e-scooter, about, about common sense things they can be doing just to keep their, them and their family safe. 
I've also got another idea, and I'm also worried about the workplace. Uh, many people are using scooters to get to work. They're putting them to basements, discrete areas, into the buildings. And this could also be a fire risk, especially if they're left there overnight. Will you commit to working with the London Fire Brigade and boroughs to ensure that all employers in London are made aware of the fire risks uh, posed by e-scooters and what they can do to mitigate those risks? Well, again, Chair, another example of we're doing some good work. So the TFL seat hall has done some good work, but can't give you a guarantee we've not we've done that work with employees in the private sector and so forth so again I'll make sure the questions he has asked are circulated to my team to make sure that it gives the challenge we need to be asking these questions because you're right somebody may use an e-scooter to legally get to their place of work but the e-scooter may be a fire risk are the work taking the right steps and similarly chair why don't I ask Jules Pipe to make sure our planning is in the right place we've done lots of good work to make sure there's cycle parking in new developments question have we made sure we're, we're raising the awareness about people who may park their e-scooter in a new development? So can I just take that away, Chair, just to keep the ties to make sure we've thought about... Because this is a developing area. There are things we've probably not thought of. Mm. Uh, and again, this sort of challenge is good, I think. Well, I look forward to hearing from all the deputy mayors on this. Thank you yeah. so much. <laughs> thank, thank, thank you. Um, thank you for that number of commitments there. I, I welcome those commitments, having almost tripped over um, an e-scooter at Barking Station a little while ago, so I, I, I welcome the moves in that direction. Um, the next question concerns spy-free shopping, and that's from Assemblymember Polanski. Thank, thank you, uh, Chair. In September 2021, I published my Emerging Technology Charter for London, a set of practical and ethical guidelines for the trialling and deployment of new data-enabled technology in public services or the public realm. London is the first city in the UK to publish such a, such a charter, and I've been told actually the first in Europe. We've led the way because we're keen to foster an environment where technology can flourish and does so in a responsible way that respects our rights. We've incorporated the UK Information Commissioner's recent opinion into the charter, including on the use of biometric data, such as in facial recognition software. The UK Information Commissioner's office sets a very high bar for use of biometric data, such as live facial recognition technologies, in public spaces by non-law enforcement bodies. The ICO requires that the use of these technologies considers the potential for bias, examines the impacts on the rights and freedoms of its citizens, and demonstrates that other less intrusive measures cannot reasonably achieve the same purpose. If these technologies cannot meet the tests set out by the ICO, then they should not be deployed in London. I have no powers to regulate the use of life facial recognition in private spaces, but through the Emerging Technology Charter, I provide clear guidance to both public and private sector organisations in London on how to implement innovative technologies in a way that is open and sustainable, and which respects London's diversity and keeps citizens' data safe. My Chief Digital Officer for London, Theo Blackwell, and I continue to promote these guidelines and encourage their adoption. On the 8th of October last year, I adopted my public London charter. It sets out eight principles owners and managers of public spaces need to follow to ensure that any new public spaces in London are safe, accessible and inclusive. And my London plan requires all development that creates new public space to be managed in accordance with the charter. The charter requires developers, managers and landowners to only put in place rules restricting the behaviour of the public that are essential for safe management of the space it sets out that public space should be managed to respect the privacy of all users, ensuring that the use of smart technologies in these spaces is properly justified, as well as being legal and compliant with the relevant codes of practice. Thank you for your work on this already, Mr. Mayor. I'm concerned about the loss of privacy through biometric uh, data, potentially if when we're going to a supermarket, we're being recorded, uh, collected, shared, stored, all of that data when we're just going for a loaf of bread. And Londoners deserve and need a spy-free shopping experience in their city. So I've written to all the major supermarkets to ask them if they currently use live facial recognition technology or if they're planning to use it in the future. Because this is here, Mr. Mayor, this is dangerous and it's already trickling into London. Now, some of the supermarkets were brilliant and have got back to me already to say they don't use it. Shout out to Sainsbury's, Waitrose, Tesco's, although other brands are available. But a fair few of them have refused to say. Now, the government have failed to legislate on this so far. 
So would you agree with me, at the very least, that these supermarkets need to be transparent about the recording and use of data? Which I, I've not seen the letter, so I can't comment on whether the letter is a, a reasonable request or, or not. But we all want uh, a, a similar plan scheme to be able to buy his loaf of bread and, and not worry about his privacy, privacy being uh, infringed. I would remind him, though, uh, that there is lots of closed-circuit TV. And if we were speaking uh, 20, 30 years ago, he would not unreasonably uh, be asking questions about transparency around CEC uh, TV. And it's because of this challenge we've had improvements made around CCTV. And that's why he's so right to ask these questions, to get us the reassurance we need around transparency, around what happens to the data, us being informed uh, that it's being used, and so forth and so forth. And that's why I think it is important for uh, you know, people, with this, people with an interest in this area, like you know, something like Polanski, to continue to challenge those in the private sector, those in government. I want to be an ally. I'm more than happy if you send me the letter. Uh, you know, I can, I can help in relation to getting the information because all the member's asking for is transparency. All he's asking for is to know whether somebody who he does business with is using this technology. And I think it's not an unreasonable request. So why don't we speak offline about, about sharing your letter uh, and we can see what we can do to try and get what I think is not an unreasonable question asked uh, to people who we do custom with. I really appreciate that. Anything you could do to champion this spy-free shopping pledge would be excellent. Now, we've spoken before about San Francisco banning live facial recognition technology, and you said to me quite rightly that they have very different powers to London, and, and I agree. Um, but one power you do have, and you just alluded to it, is that power of guiding and influencing businesses. So what are you and the Deputy Mayor for Business doing to make sure that we're championing good practice and condemning those who uh, are spying, essentially? Well, Chair, you know, I'm very competitive, and when, when Zach mentioned San Francisco, and he, he dared to suggest City X is better than London, I looked, I looked and spoke to colleagues in San Francisco to see what they were doing. So uh, I just want to rebut your point that another city is doing more than us. So you're right, several US cities, including San Francisco, have ordinances uh, 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 in place, including San Francisco, but the GDPR in our country uh, trumps actually some of the ordinances uh, they have. But also, even in San Francisco, uh, it only applies to law enforcement uh, or, by, or, or those uh, technologies used by city agencies, not by private operators. So, in fact, I'm looking forward to sharing my charter with San Francisco so they can learn from us about how we uh, balance innovation uh, with protecting our rights. Thank you very much, Mr. Mayor. Thank you. The next question. <laughs> concerns protecting leaseholders and social housing tenants safety at home post Grenfell and that's asked by assembly member Moema thanks chair the building safety crisis is one of the most pressing challenges facing our city and i'm committed to doing all i can to protect londoners i'm really grateful for the assembly members continuing lobbying on this really important area the building safety bill presents the best opportunity for systematic change the bill introduces new measures to improve safety, including increased scrutiny of new high-rise developments. However, the bill does need to be strengthened in some areas. While I welcome Michael Gove, the Secretary of State's recent announcement that industry is expected to fund cladding remediation on buildings between 11 and 18 metres in height, this must be backed by firm and explicit protection for leaseholders through an amendment to the bill. I'm also deeply concerned that there is still no confirmed funding for buildings with non cladding related defects and those below 11 metres. We continue to lobby the government on this. Meanwhile, I'm doing everything in my power to ensure that GLA's partners are meeting the highest standards of building safety. I've introduced tough fire safety requirements within the Affordable Homes Programme 2021 to 2026 and the London Development Plan and new measures in the London Plan. My Home for Londoners board created an EWS1 task and fitness group which will support landlords in improving residents' experience, especially through the EWS1 process. The group's best practice guidance to be published shortly aims to trigger behavioural change, particularly on resident communications. I wrote to building owners and managers in both 2020 and 2021, encouraging them to implement the relevant Grenfell Tower inquiry phase one recommendations early, and I'll continue to engage with them on this issue. I also wrote to building owners who have been slow to take action despite receiving funding from government remediation funds, which my housing team administers. I'll continue working with the government and partners to ensure funding decisions and remediation works are completed as soon as possible. 
Thank you, Mayor Khan. Um, and I just wanted to say that I've really found it instrumental listening to you and others um, at the Grenfell um, Inquiry um, evidence sessions in the last few months. And I just wanted to ask you, so obviously we've had the, a change in um, Secretary of State who appears slightly more positive about homes in general. And um, Michael Gove has committed uh, to provide clarity on what the government will do by Easter, which is a couple of months away. So I wonder what opportunities there now, between now and Easter, to work with um, the DLUC Secretary of State to look at the convening powers that the mayor might have or be given to make sure that you're able to work with leaseholders and registered providers who provide those homes for social housing tenants um, to continue to put pressure on managing agents and freeholders to compel them to pay for those costs, particularly the non-cladding non -cladding costs that you've talked about. I think your question is so important in illustrating that even though there are areas we've got no powers to act, uh, we will both convene where we can, but also lobby the government those members of this assembly who are of the same parties, the government don't like it, but we shouldn't be scared to call out the government when action is required. But also we should be brave enough uh, to compliment government when they get it right. I think Michael Gove's uh, you know, transformation of this area over the last few weeks is incredibly impressive. As we're meeting today, he's meeting developers uh, to try and put pressure on them to do far more. We were saying this for the last four and a half years, criticised by that lot, and there's been change because of our lobbying. And that's why we've got to be confident in continuing to lobby and not allow uh, conservative voices in this assembly uh, to silence us when we uh, do so. So the good news is some of the work Tom Copley did in relation to a method, a device to get this remediation paid for has been taken up by the government. Getting developers uh, to contribute uh, towards a, a position they helped create in relation to a levy was an idea from Tom and the team in City Hall and I'm really pleased the government's running with this. Leaseholders shouldn't be out of pocket because of things that aren't their uh, fault. And so we're going to use our convening powers. I've said in my answer some of the stuff I've done written to building owners, working with the government uh, to, to put pressure on them. Some have received funds but aren't taking action. Trying to find out who the owners are. Some are offshore. Uh, the government's got the expertise to try and find out who they uh, are. And I think working with Michael Gove and his team, uh, we can make more progress. I've highlighted some of the areas where there still needs to be progress. And I think this Easter, uh, sh th there should be sufficient progress when it comes to the fifth anniversary of Grenfell Tower. Uh, we aren't talking about families still living in dangerous uh, buildings. Thank you very much, Mr. Mayor. I just really quickly wanted to ask you, um, within that, there, are, there is, a, if you like, a loophole, which, again, the Secretary of State has committed to uh, looking at, but hasn't made a commitment around closing, and that is the loophole around leaseholders, sorry, leaseholders being passed on the cost of those costs of the works that need to be done to um, their buildings and their homes. So um, I wonder if within that you will be able to commit uh, to working to ensure that that is closed. I know that's something that you committed to in the manifesto, and I really think that Londoners would really welcome that, those people that are in homes which um, it's entirely legal for those freeholders to do what they're doing, which is bankrupting people. Yeah, and, and by the way, I, I, I'm not sure if you have, but I've met families whose dream of being a homeowner has turned into a nightmare because they're leaseholders and their homes aren't uh, safe and will continue to lobby the government. But we should also, you know, recognise the progress has been made. Michael Wilde deserves huge credit and we hope we can just push him further because no family should uh, have their dream of owning a home being turned into a nightmare. Thank you. The next question concerns review, the review of advertising on Transport for London services, and that's in the name of Assemblymember Berry. Th thank you, Chair. Uh, TfL has a comprehensive and rigorous advertising policy and copy review process, and its media partners continue to work with advertisers to ensure all advertising that runs on TfL's network complies with both TfL policy and advertising standard authority regulations. TfL's advertising policy is not static. It is adapted and updated to respond to changing circumstances. In June 2016, a month after I was first elected as mayor, I instructed TfL to update its policy to ensure advertising does not cause pressure to, uh, con uh, to conform to an unrealistic or unhealthy body shape or create body confidence issues, particularly amongst young people. In February 2019, I asked TfL to update its policy again to include restrictions on advertising for food and non-alcoholic drinks high in fat, sugar or salt. 
in support of my London food strategy, which highlighted that London has one of the highest levels of childhood obesity in Europe. In both cases, we've seen advertising on the TfL network has changed for the better since our policy changes were introduced. I said in my manifesto, TfL is currently working with the GLA to develop a new policy for advertising associated with harmful gambling. However, TfL is not the regulatory body for out-of-home advertising in London, and as such, TfL advertising policy is underpinned by a requirement for all advertisers to comply with the ASA's advertising codes and advertising guidelines. TfL's media partners work closely with the Committee of Advertising Practice to ensure that the ASA's requirements are correctly interpreted by advertisers. Where necessary, the advice of the Committee of Advertising Practice may be sought to ensure that, in their view, the advertising copy complies with the advertising code. TfL also has further safety mechanisms in place in specific areas. For example, since 2018, TfL has asked its advertising partners to refer all cryptocurrency advertising to them for review prior to it running on TfL Estate, so it can ensure that campaigns contain sufficient information to comply with both its policy and the ASA ruling. And in response to the ASA's investigation into some cryptocurrency advertisements following complaints in late 2021, TfL has taken the further interim measure of refusing copy where the advertisement contains imagery or messaging similar to nature to those being investigated. And I'm pleased that the government's announced earlier this week that it plans to legislate to address misleading crypto asset providers. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Mayor. That was, that was a really useful rundown of, of events so far. Um, I'm here today to put to you, an, an, again, an idea I raised, a first raised a while ago. Um, in June 2019, um, I had an oral question in the old City Hall about having a wider review of advertising policies. And then I asked you for a proactive review in order to anticipate some of these things rather than waiting for, for new scandals. And after the 2021 election, I pitched to your team a proposal with two parts. Now, I know the idea of charging differently for things with different social and environmental impacts. It went down very, very badly at that meeting, and I'm not pressing that one today. But the other part, I think, would solve a lot of problems and fuss. And this was to take a specific green list approach to permitted product categories, not one that's just reactive and leaves us playing whack-a-mole with new problems as they emerge, such as the cryptocurrencies you've talked about, also the, the short-term lettings companies that we, we had to retrospectively ban. Um, I think, you know, it, it has been a real issue to have to keep fixing things. It's taken a while, for example, to ban gambling adverts, but we saw a surge last year when people were particularly vulnerable. So I just wondered, would you be prepared to discuss again with me this aspect of my proposals, the green listing approach, where new product categories need to apply and demonstrate they're not going to harm Londoners before they get to be included in the policy? Well, I think, I think the TfL uh, works in partnership with not just as media partners, but those responsible for advertising both regulations and, and the codes. Uh, we're always proactive in relation to issues that we think are, are emerging, and uh, our criteria is far more rigorous than the advertising uh, standards. For example, we're doing some uh, thinking in relation to fossil fuels. In uh, to exactly that there, as well, yeah, yeah. In relation to what goes on uh, mm. uh, there. But I think we can't be prescriptive. And so, you know, we, we are adapting our policies to make sure they meet the, the needs of the, the market, our third-party partners, but also being a responsible uh, place where adverts are placed. I think the responsibility in TfL uh, is twinfold. First, we've got to make sure we maximise revenues for the reasons I've rehearsed in relation to the financial challenges caused by the pan pandemic, but also we've got a responsibility. Yeah. Um, if, I can, if I can clarify, though, I mean, I'm talking about a change in approach from essentially what we have now, which is a banned list, to uh, a green list, uh, a list that then people need to apply to join. And that's a, that's a change in, in approach completely. And I didn't expect you not to have any issues with this. And I, I've asked for a further discussion. Um, would you be prepared to help organise that, maybe with you or with the people at TfL who might have practical questions? Chair, I found it's a huge benefit to both me and Londoners uh, to regularly meet with Sean, and so I'm more than happy uh, to organise for such a... <laughs> Thank you, Mr Mayor. You'll, uh, you'll do it anyway uh, in the end, so let's just get it over with. <laughs> listen, listen, I'm here for all Londoners, Sean, including well, you. Well, well time, Assembly Member, that your Chris the Green Group is now out of time. Um, will the Assembly agree to suspend Standing Order 2.9b in accordance with the provisions of Standing Order 1.1h in order to allow the remaining business on the agenda to be completed. Okay. I heard agreed. Chairman, okay. sorry, it's me. 
Uh, can I just make a request? I don't know if my colleagues are as frozen as I am. I saw the mayor was frozen earlier. Uh, we were rather hoping that if we were moving to a new building, we wouldn't be as frozen as we were in the old one. But certainly, <laughs> down, I know up there it's not as cold, but I mean, my feet and I know the mayors are absolutely frozen. So if anybody's listening that's got control of the on switch, can we have the heating on, please? Chair, Chair can, I, can I also have it noted uh, on record that both Susan Hall and I agree? Right. <laughs> yes, do note that, because it could be the last time. <laughs> actually, I think you've got full cross-party agreement from everybody. I, I, I'm actually wearing a blanket over my knees. Um, Assemblymember Pigeon is wearing a very heavy-looking scarf, and numbers of colleagues are, are wrapped up very warm. Yeah. So please, more heat, more heat, please. You're all such lightweights, aren't you? <laughs> um, so um, uh, I, I think we are aware that this is this is a problem for for this for this session, and I've been assured that this will be resolved in the future. Thank so, you, Chair. Thank you very much. Thank you, Susan. Um, right. If you let me, we've resolved that. The next uh, question is, concerns the London Drugs Commission. And it's in the name of Assembly Member Devonish. Thank you, Chair. We know that drugs drive crime, violence, and antisocial behaviour and are damaging Londoners' health. I've long said that we need a more robust evidence base to inform practical policy making on this important issue. It's time for fresh ideas to reduce the harms drugs and drug related crimes cause to individuals, families, and communities. We're overdue an evidence based review of experience and learning from across the world, exploring how best we can reduce harms that drugs like cannabis can cause. That's why my London Drugs Commission will see independent experts from the fields of law, public health, criminal justice and community relations examine the effectiveness of our drugs laws with a particular focus on cannabis. I'll ask the Commission to bring forward recommendations with the aim of helping to address violent and drug-related crime, improve public health and help people recover from addiction. What the Commission will not do, however, is look at the classification of Class A drugs, which I'm absolutely clear must remain illegal. On drugs like cannabis, there are differing views and approaches, and we need to understand these to have a proper grown-up discussion about the way forward. The former Conservative Party leader and Foreign Secretary William Hague has written about the decriminalisation of drugs, as has the Conservative Chair of this Assembly. And the Prime Minister himself has signalled the need for a new approach in the government's recent drug strategy. I have at no point pledged to decriminalise drugs, but there is a debate to be had on approaches to the use of cannabis. And I think it's important that the Commission gathers the evidence that can inform the debate. We know, for example, that enforcement against the use of cannabis disproportionately criminalises young black men, and we need to consider the impact this has on our communities. This does not mean being soft on drugs. On the contrary, I'll continue to fully support the police in targeting those causing harm to our communities. It's right to be cautious when considering approaches that will affect people's lives, and that's why I'm establishing the Commission to gather all the evidence. I don't want to preempt the recommendations of the Commission, and I hope this Assembly will be open to the evidence presented when the Commission reports back. Mr Mayor. A third of psychosis cases in London are the result of smoking skunk, according to extensive research conducted by Sir Robin Murray, a professor of psychiatric research at King's College London. Do you accept this is a very dangerous thing that you are going to do? I can't see what you've got against him giving evidence to the Commission. I mean, why, why can't people like him present to the Commission what they are uh, saying? I think what we've seen in the recent past, but the long-distance past, when it comes to issues around uh, cannabis. People having a small amount of cannabis in their possession, arrested, charged, prosecuted, have a conviction which affects their life chances, and then later on are caught again with a small amount of cannabis in their possession, arrested, charged, prosecuted, given another sentence, and get another further conviction, and that cycle is repeated. Uh, I can't see what anybody with uh, uh, any sense of reasonableness could have against uh, an independent commission going away to look at the evidence, hearing from the sort of experts you're talking about, also hearing indeed from the member himself with strong health views he has, and then coming back with uh, a report with the recommendations going forward. Well, another study from Oxford University has shown that weed increases the risk of depression in teenagers by 40%. This is a very dangerous road you're going down, 
uh, Mr Mayor, and even your own party leader seems to agree. And have you seen a letter from our old friend, uh, former Assembly Member Bacon, now uh, Gareth Bacon MP? Fifteen London MPs wrote to you on the 11th of January about this very serious route that you're going down. Sorry, th those MPs did not write to complain about a drugs commission, which is the route I'm going down. Uh, they certainly did. I'll send you the letter. I've got it right oh, well, in front of me. I've seen the letter. Uh, the Drugs Commission is a sensible approach to this issue. And by the way, the, the, the recent drugs strategy published by uh, this government with the Prime Minister, that's adored so much by some members of the Assembly, said, and I quote, those who are caught in possession of drugs for the first time may be required to attend a drugs awareness course so they have the opportunity to understand the harms of drugs and change their behaviour. So I suggest those MPs write to their Prime Minister if they've got a problem with a recent drug strategy published by this government. I think, Mr Mayor, you're doing your usual and trying to uh, take something the government's doing and twist it. I'll leave it there, I'm reading for debate on what they say. Thank you, sir. The um, next question <coughs> concerns hate crime, and it's in the name of Assemblymember Prince. Thank you, Chair. <coughs> it's vital that Londoners feel confident to report hate crime. Doing so provides the best opportunity for victims to be supported and for the police to catch the perpetrators. London's diversity is one of its greatest assets. An attack on someone simply because of who they are is an attack on us all. And my determination to take a zero-tolerance approach to hate crime is undiminished in my second term. To get more people to report hate crime, we must understand the barriers to reporting. Firstly, there is sometimes a lack of understanding and awareness of hate crime and what it is. We know that even victims of hate crime, some of whom face abuse or attack every time they leave the house, can normalise this abuse to the point they don't recognise that what has happened to them is a criminal offence. I've taken a number of steps to address this. I fund the London Resources for National Hate Crime Awareness Week and Londoners will have seen the Stand Up Against Hate Crime campaign on the Transport Network. I also funded a Together Against Hate outreach programme which included local community organisations producing awareness raising material in formats appropriate to their own communities. Another barrier is victim confidence to report and confidence that action will be taken. To help address this, the NPS has improved its training so officers can better recognise hate crime and provide a robust investigation. The NPS also now assesses the situation of all victims of hate crime to ensure that appropriate victim support can be offered. Many victims feel more confident about engaging with the police and criminal justice process with the support of specialist organisations. The new Hate Crime Victim Service supports a number of specialist victim support organisations who can accept reports that victims make to them rather than directly to the police. The Crime Survey for England and Wales indicates that the number of people who say they've experienced hate crime has fallen over the last decade, while we know the number of hate crimes reported continues to increase. That shows that the hard work we, the police and communities have done is delivering results. More people are reporting what has happened to them. However, the same survey still indicates that hate crime remains significantly underreported, so I'm determined that our work raises awareness, provides support to victims and builds the confidence to report hate crime will carry on. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I'm very short of time. I was going to debate the different types of reporting and the different uh, levels of reporting on the different types of crime, but the big ask really is, um, you're right, we need to get more of these reported. I agree with you. Um, would you commit to doing an advertising campaign on the underground and on the advertising spaces that you have to encourage more people to report hate crime and explain the different routes they have? They don't have to go via the police? Well, we have, uh, as, I, as I mentioned, got the campaign on the underground. I'm slightly nervous because the chair of the Budget Performance Committee is always criticising me for uh, spending uh, resources, time, effort in marketing. And so if he can get her to agree to this, I'm sure I can look into this. We're, we're not promoting you, you Mr Mayor. We're, we're trying to get people to report hate crime. Uh, well, well, adverts cost money. Uh, uh, and so if, he's, if, he, if he can persuade the chair of his Budget Performance Committee to see the benefits of marketing to see the benefits of promotion, I'm more than happy uh, to look into ideas. He's uh, got another example of the left hand of the Conservative Party not knowing what the right hand's doing. Assembly Member Desai. <coughs> 
Thank you, Chair. Mr. Mayor, the government uh, was defeated in the Lords um, uh, by an amendment calling for the introduction of misogyny as a hate crime. Sadly, since then, we've heard the Deputy Prime Minister say that the government plans to vote down this amendment in the Commons. Are you surprised that the government and the Prime Minister continue to be so set against the introduction of this measure to better protect w uh, women? A yes or no answer will suffice. And what more can you do as Mayor to support this, uh, uh, the, this particular cause? I'm surprised. Uh, let me see why I'm surprised. Because we saw after the outpouring of uh, uh, views from women and girls across the country about violence against them, the government saying they were listening. And that's why I think it's a, uh, it will be a wasted opportunity if the government doesn't make misogyny a hate crime. Thank you. Thank you. The next question cons uh, is from uh, concerns Bond Street Station Crossrail Works, and it's from Assembly Member Best. Thank, thank you, Chair. The Elizabeth Line will transform life and travel in London and the South East, reducing journey times, creating much needed capacity with longer trains and spacious stations, transforming accessibility, and providing a huge economic boost for the country. When fully open, the Elizabeth Line will increase central London's rail capacity by 10%. A significant progress continues to be made and the project is now in its com complex final stages with the central section due to open in the first half of this year. Eight out of ten stations in the central section have now been handed over to TfL with Canary Wharf due to be handed over by the end of this month. Bond Street has always been the station that has faced the most challenges in terms of installation, construction and fit-out works. It was also uniquely affected by COVID-19 and because of the extent of the work remaining and the number of people required on site to complete the station during the pandemic, the work at Bond Street had had to be replanned. Towards the end of last year, we commenced the first phase of trial operations on the new railway in line with the earliest forecast dates. This is the final phase of the Crossrail programme and part of the process by which we ensure the Elizabeth Line can open with the highest levels of reliability and safety. Bond Street has met its requirement to support trial operations. This means that the station is ready for full-scale passenger evacuation and emergency intervention. This is the minim minimum requirement needed for the railway to enter into passenger service and is key to ensuring the Elizabeth Line opens safely. Bond Street remains at a less advanced stage than the other Elizabeth Line Central London stations, but good progress continues to now be made. Uh, uh, may I interrupt you there, Mr Mayor? Apologies, but the uh, Conservative group is now out of time, so we have to Sorry, move on to the Ted, next question. Can I just clarify, did I miss a day in that answer? Did I miss if, a you, day? if you had more time, I could answer that, couldn't I? <laughs> <laughs> can, I can I suggest that you write to the member with, uh, with a date? Thank you. Um, the next question is... Uh, Time. The next question concerns domestic abuse and homelessness, and that's in the name of Assembly Member Sheikh. Thank you, Chair. Survivors of domestic abuse and other forms of violence against women and girls should not have to choose between safety and a home. Preventing their homelessness is critical, as is tackling the violence itself, and we're funding several programmes to help achieve this. We've invested over £15 million in programmes to address the actions of perpetrators including to prevent further abuse and upheaval for survivors. My £1.5 million COVID response for people fleeing violence has so far supported over 300 adults and children. My Pan London Housing Reciprocal and Housing Move schemes help survivors in social housing to move to safety and retain their tenancy rights. Addressing the needs of homeless women is a key part of the work plan of the jointly led City Hall and London Borough Life of the Streets group. I'm using my new powers and funding under Part 4 of the Domestic Abuse Act to improve support for survivors in safe accommodation. My recently published Domestic Abuse Safe Accommodation Strategy sets out proposals to ensure all survivors can access safe accommodation with the support they need. I welcome the change in the Domestic Abuse Act 2021 to extend priority need to all survivors of domestic abuse. Since becoming Mayor, ensuring London is safe for women and tackling rough sleeping have been personal priorities of mine. It's critical that the work we've pioneered on both, including during the pandemic, does not go to waste. This requires sustainable and substantial resource from the government, as well as policy changes to tackle the root causes. Uh, 
Thank you very much, Mr. Mayor, and it's good to be in this new chamber for our first MQTs of the year. Um, Mr. Mayor, I wanted to ask specifically, sort of based on research when I was leading up to this question, it became very apparent to me that BAME women and transgender people fall through the data gap on domestic abuse. Um, you know, give, many groups who advocate on this suggest exactly that, um, and that the assessment of what constitutes domestic abuse doesn't adequately reflect the experiences of BAME women and transgender people who are victims of domestic abuse. So how can we at City Hall help address this? Well, firstly, we've got to recognise uh, that this year is an important one. Although in numerical terms it may be a smaller number, uh, they're vulnerable. So the first thing we can do, and we are doing, is support those groups that work with these people in London. Uh, and that's why we're funding uh, black-led groups, uh, black Asian minority-led groups, and also groups with expertise, top trans Londoners that you're referring to, because they've got the credibility, the reach uh, to reach these uh, Londoners. Uh, and they need support. And so our funding gives them the support to be able to do so. Secondly, uh, we're, we're going to make sure that the support the government's giving London councils and ourselves is used to help the most vulnerable Londoners, and that includes the group you're uh, talking about. And thirdly, uh, I, think, I think mainstream groups should also be understanding the responsibility they have to talk about these groups who can, as you've alluded to, fall through the cracks to make sure they get the help that they need as well. Mm, thank you. And actually, following on from Assemblyman McCartney's question at the last MQTs on exactly this, um, subsequently in uh, December uh, the 21st in 2021, the government announced the Homeless Prevention Grant. Um, 5.8 million will be uh, sort of allocated to people um, and councils uh, to support people who are being made homeless from domestic abuse. So how much of that was being allocated to London and what is that going towards specifically? So the government allocates uh, allocate this money because it's a new burden uh, on uh, uh, councils, uh, and they allocated uh, more than three hundred million pounds to English local authorities. Of the uh, three hundred and fifteen million pounds, uh, London received um, five point eight million pounds, uh, and, and this will be uh, councils using the money to um, help. Uh, the sort of group of people we're talking about. These are the new burdens placed upon council because of the changes in legislation in relation to priority need. Uh, frankly speaking, we need much more than that in relation to provide the safe accommodation, build the homes, uh, and so forth. Uh, at the moment, what, what, what I'm afraid happen is temporary accommodation be used. So we're paying monies to private landlords, which had we built the homes ourselves, uh, we could pr provide help long term for far more people. Thank you. That long-term and holistic solution is, is still much needed from what I can hear. And I'll be following up with you if that's okay, given that I know over Christmas you're going to speak to some specialist groups who deal with specifically people who are made homeless from domestic abuse. So it'd be good to hear what they've Absolutely. said. So I look forward to following up on that with you. Thank you. The next question concerns trust and confidence in the police, and that comes from Assemblymember Desai. Thank you, Chair. Keeping our city safe relies on strong relationships between the police and all of London's communities. Key to improving trust is having a police service that better represents and understands Londoners. As a result of uh, my action plan, we've provided £1.2 million to the police over three years to support the recruitment and progression of black officers. We've also made uh, £700,000 available for community-led training uh, so officers can understand local communities they're serving. Uh, Claire Waxman, OBE, uh, London's Victims Commissioner, uh, has engaged directly with uh, black women survivors to ensure their experiences are better understood and this will inform my strategy for tackling violence against women and girls. Additionally, the police's uh, public action survey has been extended to ensure the voices of London's black communities are better represented. F following a review of uh, pre-arrest handcuffing, the Met Police Service has revised their policy to ensure officers are accountable for their use. And this further we're undertaking we're undertake to uh, strengthen uh, London's ability to hold the police to account, which is going to be really important if we're going to build confidence going forward, as is the review that Dame Louise Case is doing, which will be looking into cultural and standards of behaviour within the police service. Uh, thank you, Mr Mayor. So, along with London's black communities, many women in London are also understandably now less trusting of the police following Sarah Everett's murder, number of other scandals involving serving uh, met officers. You already mentioned your action plan and the case review into the mass standards. Uh, and also, I think it's um, important to stress the findings of the Daniel Morgan inquiry, which branded the MET as, quote, institutionally corrupt. Most recently, following the truly shocking allegations that have emerged from the Stephen Port inquiry, 
You commissioned Her Majesty's Inspectorate to conduct an investigation of the MAT Police's investigation standards. So I want to very specifically ask you about this. Uh, uh, can you say that if this uh, inquiry will consider whether homophobia or other uh, prejudices impact on the mass investigations? And secondly, do you think any other work needs to go into reassuring London's LGBT plus community that they can trust the MAT to protect them, particularly given the rising levels of homophobic hate crime across the city? Well, I think firstly, anybody who saw even part of the evidence that came out during those inquests will have been shocked at the number of mistakes made by the police service. Uh, they caused me huge concern. The fact they were in 2014, 2015 is irrelevant. We've got to make sure uh, that uh, our LGBTQ plus communities feels reassured that the police is there for them as well. And that's why the work we're doing is so important, uh, not simply to make sure that the police has changed for the better, but to reassure those communities who suffer in silence. So Louise Case's work is looking at the culture that includes homophobia, and the work HMI are doing as well. Uh, we'll see if there is still any concerns that we need to address, uh, and the Commissioner herself has personally uh, reassured me that she takes this issue very uh, seriously. It's really important uh, that we provide that reassurance based upon the evidence, not blind reassurance, reassurance based upon the work that's, been, that's taken place. Thank you. And you will be aware that Buckingham Council have actually called for an inquiry into the IOPC um, and their investigation into some of the issues raised as well. But I just want to move on because of time. Mr. Mayor, if the police are to strengthen their standards and integrity and the confidence the public have in them, then the procedures for calling out bad behaviour internally must be strong and, more importantly, trusted by MET officers. I have received information which shows an overall fall in the use of the MAP's internal whistleblowing hot, uh, hotlines in recent years. Is this an issue that you're aware of and feel needs resol uh, uh, resolving? Well, one of the things that concern me in relation to uh, uh, the behaviour of the servant police officer who uh, abducted, raped and killed Sarah Everard <coughs> uh, was for there to be a lot of ways to check the behaviour of police officers who may be misbehaving. Uh, in advance of the criminalities we're talking about in that particular uh, case. So in addition to the hotline you referred to, uh, there is a number of things that, that the police are doing to make sure we're reassured. Uh, they're making sure that uh, officers are given the confidence to challenge inappropriate behaviour by other officers, particularly towards uh, uh, women. We're also making sure there's an improved sexual harassment uh, uh, policy, uh, a toolkit for uh, uh, leaders, uh, support, support for uh, women and minorities in the police service. So, the hotline shouldn't be the only way officers who are unhappy go to. That may lead to a reduction in numbers to the hotline because there are no other things uh, they can uh, do. We've got to completely be, transform the culture in the police service and be reassured it's been transformed. Thank you, Mr. Beer, and thank you also for earlier describing the Roll Dogs as a great part of London. Further proof, if any is needed, London is moving east. Here, here. Thank you, Assembly Member, and for the plug for the east. Um, the, um, uh, the next question concerns COVID-19 vaccinations in London, um, and on this occasion it's going to be asked by Sem Moema. Thank you, Chair. Uh, 17.1 million doses have now been delivered to Londoners, including almost 4 million people receiving their booster, and more than 87% of adult Londoners have had their first dose. It's been a monumental effort, and we owe the NHS and volunteers a huge set of gratitude. With high numbers of COVID cases and the NHS under pressure, it's vital we continue to do all we can to vaccinate Londoners. I'm continuing to support the NHS in its work to improve access to the vaccine, including promoting vaccine clinics open at convenient times and walk-in centres for Londoners, regardless of immigration status and GP registration. I'm also working closely with partners to deliver communication campaigns to promote the vaccine to all Londoners, especially those targeted by disinformation around vaccines. I don't want any Londoner to be left behind in the vaccine rollout, so I've announced new big conversation sessions to encourage frank, honest and open dialogue on the question and concerns Londoners have about the safety of the jabs. I've also launched a video campaign to help encourage young people to take up the offer of the life-saving vaccine. I urge anyone who has not yet had their booster or is still waiting to take their first or second doses to book their appointment as soon as possible to help protect themselves, their loved ones and the NHS. Thank you, Mayor Khan. 
Um, I just wanted to um, ask you about what, you, what your views are on what might be the core reasons behind um, vaccine hesitancy. Um, you know, notwithstanding the, some, the unedifying spectacles that we've had at People's Question Time, people, Londoners do have genuine concerns and there are ways to address those. I just wondered what's your message to those people who are reluctant to come forward and take the vaccine um, because of misinformation that they might hear or see? Yeah, I think, I think you, you, your question is really important because you, you, if you park for a second the anti-vaxxers and those who believe, those who believe in conspiracies, quite a large number of those who have not yet had the first vaccine are genuinely hesitant for you know, reasons that we can address uh, the interview persuaded. So the big conversation sessions are about having experts who are respected like Professor Kevin Fenton, uh, Vin Dewarka and others, uh, Dr. W. Wicks, Bernard, and so forth, listening to and engaging with that group and having a frank conversation. Uh, and you can understand if you're a, a black Londoner who, whose experience of people in positions of power and influence is one of distrust because of the way you've been treated, or if you're somebody whose family's had experience of pharmaceuticals in uh, uh, you know, uh, another country, uh, you can understand why you're nervous and risk averse. Uh, my message is simple uh, it's never too late. It's never too late. And the good news is, over the last seven days, we've vaccinated more than 21,000 Londoners with their first dose. We've made really good progress with what's called the Evergreen offer. We're not going to give up on, the, on these Londoners because we know the difference having the vaccine can make. Um, thank you for that. And um, just before Christmas, I do actually um, welcome the fact that, the, uh, that, that your office did support Walden Forest Council in um, having a last-minute pop-up vaccine um, session for um, children um, as we headed into the school holidays. But I wanted to... Um, but some of that was about helping source um, medically trained staff. So I just wanted to explore a little bit how you're working alongside the NHS to make it as easy as possible for people to, you know, make the right choice and then for those facilities to be available for them to get their first dose um, if they haven't so far had that first dose or for them to continue up to the booster. Yeah, it's really important. Well, we mustn't give up. Uh, we've, got to, we've got to make it as easy as possible uh, and have as few hurdles as possible for people to receive their first jab. Pop-up centres are important. Uh, uh, the, the Education Secretary was keen to get vaccines back into schools. Uh, we've got to make sure... We, we, we can have a sort of benefit to you, so people who like football had the benefit of going to Stanford Bridge and getting the jab and, you know... Uh, other football stadiums are also offering the facilities uh, as well, cricket venues and so forth. So we've got to think about, I don't, I don't want to use the word gimmicks because it, it's a disservice, but be innovative about what sort of things gets people in. The other great thing that we're now doing is peop, uh, experts are going out with a rucksack with the jabs, give them out, going door to door in some communities. So we really are working with councils in particular who know the communities best to try and identify which groups have been missed out and go back to them again and again and again. Thank you very much. And the next question concerns Omicron and the Metropolitan Police Service, and that's in the name of Assembly Member Harani. Thank you, Chair. The COVID-19 pandemic continues to pose considerable challenges to all uh, emergency services. I want to thank uh, uh, and recognise uh, all those responsible for uh, the hard work they've been doing to keep us safe over the last two years. I remain in close contact with the Met Police Commissioner and receive twice weekly updates on the number of officers that are sick or isolating. The current overall rate of absence due to sick and self-isolating officers is around 10%. The rate peaked at the beginning of January at 13.5% and has been slowly decreasing since. There will, of course, be times of increased absence rates in some teams and basic command unit areas. Officers and staff are stepping in for their colleagues when they're unwell or self-isolating. This does add extra pressure but the Met Police Service is using its resources flexibly, and I'm assured uh, that this has been managed well. Owing to my investment and the partial reversal of government cuts, the Met Police Service has more officers than any time since 2010, uh, 33,212 as at the end of uh, November 2021. Nonetheless, these absences are undoubtedly putting additional pressure on officers. We must all keep playing our part to limit the spread of the virus by wearing face coverings on public transport, uh, in other places uh, where it's not possible to keep our social distance and, importantly, to get vaccinated. I beg your Thank pardon. you. Thank you, Mr Mayor. And uh, just addressing, uh, I think, one issue you touched on on the end, which is the partial um, reversing cuts in police officers. Uh, we were recently told that we were going to receive 4,500 officers as part of the government's national uplift, uh, well short of the 6,000 the Commissioner called for from government to keep London safe. 
Uh, I'm concerned, for, for one, about the Met's capacity to deal with non-violent uh, crimes that are high in volume, such as burglary and theft. Uh, one particular issue that's affecting my constituency is catalytic converter theft, uh, which is uh, on the rise and has risen of 77% in Brenton Harrow uh, over the last few years. If the Met is to prevent crimes such as these, how important is it to have the adequate policing numbers to address them? You're raising an issue that causes real distress to those Londoners who own vehicles who've had their catalytic converter pinched. People come along, jack up the car, saw the uh, exhaust off, take away uh, the catalytic, that catalytic converter and make money from its uh, cell. So on the one hand, we're carrying lobbying the government for more police officers. We're still being shortchanged. Uh, I met the Home Secretary this week uh, and lobbied her again for uh, more uh, police officers. And the reason why it's important because if we're having to ration the time police officers have because they're limited numbers, those sorts of offences which are, are, are cause huge distress to some Londoners aren't a priority that they should be. And so in the absence of us getting the officers we need, the police still are working hard. Uh, we're making sure that we uh, are, are having uh, cat marking m events uh, using the Smart Water products. We're working with those who uh, you know, um, have cash for scrap, to do what we can to avoid uh, these materials having money made from them. Uh, and we're doing more, more that we can to work with the um, uh, uh, Society of Motor Manufacturers in relation to what they can do to help us in this uh, area. Uh, but that's one example of a consequence of cuts in policing over an 11-year period. Thank you. And research that I've uh, sought from the police has found that 86% of these crimes occur on Toyota, Honda or Lexus vehicles. Uh, I've written to these companies just to see what they can do to... Uh, we've got a recall uh, system, for example, where, uh, where we have safety defects that, that vehicles can be called back to the manufacturer to, to fix them. Uh, would you join my call to make sure that those vehicles that are more susceptible to these type of crimes are called back so that they can make as safe as possible without charge to the consumer because it's an issue that uh, I think that we were unaware of when these, uh, when these vehicles were produced or sold. The newer ones seem to have tackled it, but the older vehicles are still being uh, susceptible to this crime. Is this something that you'd like to see manufacturers do more on? Well, Chair, uh, Senator Member Harani has raised a really important issue, and a good example of where his expertise can help, help me. So, so why don't I, Chair, I speak to the Senator Member offline. He can share with me the letters he's written, and I, and I can amplify that. Uh, I can also make contact with uh, the manufacturers he's talking about and ask the police also to use uh, uh, Senator Member Harani's expertise to write to the uh, uh, Society of Motor Manufacturers as well, who are the umbrella group, because uh, I think uh, some of your experience locally uh, and the work you've done, we may be able to amplify across the rest of London as well. Thank you. And just uh, addressing police numbers as well, yesterday I had the pleasure of joining the new Wembley Town Centre team uh, it's, it's part of the new initiative of town centre teams that you're rolling out all across London. Uh, it's having a real difference in increasing public confidence. We spoke about trust in the police uh, before in other Assembly member questions, but businesses and residents that I spoke to also were very receptive and they felt that actually police were on the streets and, and were around and 21 officers in just a small space, 21 additional officers is making such a huge difference. Uh, that's fantastic. You'll be aware the reassurance gives people, particularly at night time, women and girls, seen high visibility policing, but also businesses uh, love seeing police officers in their town centres uh, uh, as well, and I'm really pleased. We've got these 620 additional officers in our town centres. Uh, the latest tranche will be joining in February. Uh, a good example of the investment from City Hall and the benefits of our lobbying, which some didn't like in this assembly, which has led to a partial U-turn from the government. Thank you. Thank you very much. That was the last question. Mr. Mayor, you are free to go. Thank you. Um, I'm aware a motion is being prepared at the moment, so I'm going to take other business first and return to that motion. So I'm going to take the, uh, rattle through some of the other items on the agenda before we get that. So item six is changes to committee membership and election and chair of the, Econ uh, the economy committee. Can I ask the assembly to approve the membership changes further to the GLA Conservatives group nominations as outlined in the report at recommendations 2.1 to 
And turning to recommendation 2.9, I will now take nominations for the office of Chair of the Economy Committee for the remainder of the 2021-2022 Assembly year. Assembly Member Hall. Uh, Assembly Member Neil Garrett. Uh, Assembly Member Prince has second that. Are there any other nominations for the Economy Committee? That being said, I, uh, I declare Assembly Member Neil Garrett the Chair of the Economy Committee for the remainder of the 2021-2022 Assembly year. I'm going to go to the date of the next meeting. The next scheduled meeting of the London Assembly will be the plenary draft budget meeting, which takes place at 10 a.m. on uh, Wednesday, the 26th of January, um, in this chamber. Um, I've not received notice of any other business. Now, um, yes, Assembly Member Cooper. Thank you so much. Well, actually, two small things. Obviously, we kind of made some points about the level of heating um, earlier on. Um, thank you very much for the break that you held earlier, but could I also suggest that perhaps we extend right. that slightly because obviously mm -hmm. this chamber getting out and getting back again it was a little bit tight Happy because we're not as closely situated for all relevant facilities, if I can put it that delicate. Hopefully I'm, delicately I, a point there. I, I'm more than happy to do that unless there's any strong objections, say 10 minutes in future. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Uh, you're very welcome. Um, I understand a, a, a motion is being prepared. Is that, has that been ready yet or should we take yes. a small no, recess to chair um, apologies for the lateness i just see someone walking out with some hard copies of a motion and the reason why there's been a delay is because legally we just want to check it through that it's appropriate it's a very quick motion it shouldn't take too long for the assembly to do literally as the person is walking the length of that corridor and down the stairs that's when we get it I, I wouldn't wish to, uh, to delay this assembly any further, but it's quite an important motion. Okay. Amendment, rather, Chair. Sure. You can. Good. Well, that's one good thing about the new building, then. Of course, there's many. But I, 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 th I think. Uh, when will they? When will that motion get here? Do you think? Within? Literally, I think it's the question of. Um, the stairs. They're on the way down the stairs now. Assembly Member Hall. Ch Chairman, since oh. we had no idea there was anything coming, can we have sight of this and a ten-minute uh, break so that we can uh, look and Incident. absorb what it, whatever it is it says? Yes. Um, on on receipt of that, we'll have, uh, which I think is there. Um, we'll we'll take a ten-minute recess. For uh, members to consider. Perhaps 120, Chair? 120. That yeah, that the sounds government. great to me. 120. Thank you very much. So, uh, just a recess for now. We're going to go with Sean Bailey's name.
Thank you very much. I've, I've read through and considered the motion that was presented um, uh, by, in the name of Assemblymember Deval and to be seconded by Assemblymember Russell. Uh, and I can't say, I must say, I don't think it is in order. Um, and I'll tell you why. Um, the job of this authority is to hold the Mayor of London to account. Um, and the the motion concerned mentions a particular assembly member and um, whether or not it's hidden halfway down the text or at the top of the text or at the bottom of the text it is effectively trying to hold an assembly member to account that is not the job of this assembly there are other me measures that uh, can be used however uh, i don't want to suppress that motion in any way and I would simply ask that it could be reworded to remove an assembly member from the uh, from that motion and then I will consider it in order but at the moment I'm afraid I can't uh, consider that to be the case thank you chair I'm grateful for your, uh, grateful for your consideration and thank you for the officers for their advice and members for for this coming at this late stage this is an important issue the issues that you've got before you, Chair, is finely balanced. The fact is an Assembly member was included and flouted those rules. And we have a Mayor whose one of his functions is to create and make sure that we comply with government rules and regulations. We were in a national emergency. Those are the issues. And, I, you know, in that sense, you know, I would say, and I think, you know, I, I think you, Chair, this assembly in a very excellent way and you've been very fair in the past but in finally balancing this issue on this one I think you need to think very carefully about that ruling and about the way that you're implying that ruling because it is difficult for you you're talking about a member of your political party and actually why are you saying that that should be included now just to see clarification are you saying it's the name that we need to remove or is it the reference to the assembly member because if you say the reference to an assembly member, then we on this side will pursue it. There's nothing illegal in this amendment. You can make that ruling, and then you're forcing me to challenge the chair. I don't want to challenge the chair, and I'll just, you know, in that sense, of try and replace you during this meeting for the duration of this debate. I wouldn't wish to do it for the rest of it or your office. That's not what was intended. I did not intend to even talk about the member in this debate because I was going to concentrate on the mayor's functions and the importance of politicians leading this debate and making sure that we comply with the laws and we follow the laws and that we don't actually get into the difficulties that we're seeing that brings in national government into disrepute or in terms of some of the actions here when we call for people to follow that advice. I'm sad that I've been forced to do that and I will, you know, do it once we get into the debate chair about what that, what that, what that means. But, so, sorry, so I would accept reluctantly if, the, if, it is, if it's the words are a member of this assembly and withdraw the name to enable this motion to go on. I don't wish to drag this out any longer because I think it's important about civic leadership in compliance with laws and regulations in terms of the protections that should be followed and we should all be following those at all times. Thank you for those comments and thank you for that offer which I do accept and if, uh, I mean, I don't want to rewrite it for you but, it, well... Perhaps you could rephrase it in a way that doesn't mention Yeah, I think what it would mean in terms of just in that, because um, uh, it is an amendment to the main motion on the agenda, it would read in the paragraph, this assembly shares those concerns, including in relation to the actions of those in Downing Street and indeed a member of this assembly. I, I, I think I would rule that in order. So um, that, that being said, the motion can now be debated. Uh, Assembly Member Duval. Thank you very much, Chair. It's fairly straightforward. We in who hold political office are, need to be conscious 24 hours 7, despite what the monitoring officer may say or whatever, about how we behave. And in, in relation to laws and regulations, 
it's incumbents to do it. Sometimes we make mistakes. Sometimes we make mistakes. In making mistakes, politicians are, should be very quickly responding about that they've made those mistakes and with hindsight they would have done different actions. It's when it drags on, when people are misleading people or not. What we're trying to do here today is with the mayor, is say the mayor has got this important function. If we want that function of the mayor to be able to do it, politicians have got to be seen doing what the laws say. And that's really just reminding us of where we are and in terms of some of those sacrifices London has made. And I bet every one of you around this table know of those, some of those sacrifices. You've had personal testaments and of people that have lost, lost their lives. So every one of us is. And I know around this table there are people in every political party here that believe strongly in this motion and the spirit of what this motion should be about. So I think that's why we need to do it. And actually, if this ever major emergency ever, ever occurs, we're going to learn to live. We're in a slightly different regime of learning to live with this virus now. And it has you know, taken a different stance that we think very carefully about that. And as, as elected politicians, I take seriously that, and I believe you all take seriously those issues. And that's why we should be supporting this motion in its form now and recognise that some individuals have made some mistakes. And that's where it is. And I wasn't going to mention it, but I will. And I will. And I, actually, I can do it. And I will name that, that person. If Mr Bailey, if Assemblymember Bailey had said... I apologise to this assembly and my colleagues for letting you down on that night of that party and with hindsight I shouldn't have done it and I want to apologise to the Londoners, this motion wouldn't be here before us. So I don't know whether to thank him for that, I don't know whether to thank him because this motion is before us or not, but that's what the expectation I have about that. Others would ask for ire, they think you shouldn't be here, you should resign. I'm not even going to comment on that. I'm commenting on what we should do decently of doing the right thing as elected politicians during a crisis when we're asking others to make sacrifices and do different things. Because that's what we should be doing, doing the right thing. Thank you, Chair. I move. Thank you. Uh, second Assembly Member Russell. Thank you, Chair. Now, I'm aware that uh, the motion has not been read out, and for the benefit of those watching, um, because this was not circulated before the meeting, I am going to read the motion before I um, uh, second it. The motion, the, the, the amendment to the, mo to the Chair's motion reads, we recognise that the Mayor has an important role as Police and Crime Commissioner in promoting and implementing the government's COVID regulations, and indeed that everyone in the public eye has a role in leading by example. We note in the Mayor's answers today that Londoners made huge sacrifices during this pandemic and that the cumulative effect of law-breaking, apparent lies and hypocrisy of those in positions of power make it harder for us to ask Londoners to follow regulations. This assembly shares those concerns, including in relation to the actions of those in Downing Street and indeed a member of this assembly. We urge all Londoners, including all elected politicians, to do the right thing, lead by example and adhere to the law. So that's the text of the motion that we are debating. I will um, second the amendment to the chair's motion and I simply want to reiterate my earlier sentiments about the importance of the principles of public life and that all mem Assembly members are seen to adhere to them. Thank you. Thank you. Assembly Member Pigeon. Thank you very much indeed. Um, we all have to lead by example and no one is above the law, whether that's the Prime Minister of this country and former Mayor of our great city, whether it's government ministers, whether it's elected members of this authority. Londoners sacrificed so much over the last few years. We have all sacrificed so much. We all know someone who has died who we couldn't see in person because of the rules and we had to keep to the rules. And yet, 
other people have chosen to break those rules despite being in public life, despite those Nolan principles that guide our behaviour. And it doesn't only bring shame onto themselves, it brings shame onto us all in this chamber. It brings shame onto everyone in public life. We hope on this side that the Met will properly investigate and take action against those who have broken the rules, particularly given new evidence. Parties at Downing Street, at Conservative Party headquarters. It's not acceptable. It is not acceptable in the times we find ourselves in. So Liberal Democrats fully support this amendment today before us, and I hope those who have been involved in these parties and, and the cover-up of it all will think very clearly about their position going forward. And we support the Mayor here in making sure that Londoners keep to the rules and we keep our city safe. Um, Assemblymember Hall is next. Uh, thank you, um, Chairman. There are a lot of comments in this, clearly, we, we absolutely all agree to. I'd like to put forward an amendment, though, that just removes the middle paragraph. Because if we're going to start naming names, there are names from all parties that could go in there, and I think that's wrong. We're in the middle, as we all know by now. I mean, Sue Gray must be the most famous person in the country. We know that this is uh, Downing Street, as an example, is being investigated uh, by Sue Gray. Uh, we know that we've seen pictures of Keir Starmer with pint, uh, beer bottles in his hand, Rosie Duffield. I'm sure there are many others. I don't think we should personalize this. The sentiments for trying to back Londoners doing the right thing is absolutely the right way to go. So uh, certainly the Conservatives would be more than happy to agree to the first and last paragraphs. But uh, in our amendment, we seek to take out the middle paragraph starting this amendment. This assembly shares those concerns where we're actually mentioning names. Um, we must think back. Some other people have done things that we're not happy about and it's been let go, as it were. We are in difficult times. We must support Londoners to do the right thing. I absolutely agree with you, Len, on all of that. But I'm unhappy with that middle paragraph. If that could be removed, uh, that's our amendment, uh, then we'd be very happy to, uh, to pass this through. Assemblymember Prince, I'm assuming, to second. Yeah, uh, I'm very happy to second that amendment because, you know, we're not all here. We're not all angels. We are all human beings. Um, I find it quite interesting that uh, the seconder of the original motion stands up saying how we have to give an example in public life, and yet she herself was arrested by the police, and that was all over the press, all on public, all on social media, and I don't think that gave a very good, good impression or example of how we should behave. So I would absolutely support our amendment. Um, but having said that, the principle, the spirit, uh, and, and the feeling behind this motion, I absolutely support. Thank you. Can I just, for technical reasons, explain what uh, Assemblymember Hall has effectively proposed, which is another motion that is the same as that, rather than a, an amendment to an amendment? I know, I know it's awkward, but you can do it if it's a separate motion with, of that text. Uh, are there any other speakers on that? Right, I'm going to put first... Yes, I, 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 my, my, of course, please do. And look, many of you know that I would be reasonable. I've said that this motion wouldn't be here today if individuals had stepped up and done the right thing. I stand by that. Many of you know that if it was a member of my own group, I'd be very clear where I stand on those issues. Or even members of my own party and the National Party, I'd be very clear on it. I would stand by that. I couldn't live with myself. I couldn't live with myself in terms of uh, saying one thing in one place and doing another thing in another. Chair, in terms of reflection, if this was a genuine mistake by individuals and hadn't been dragged out for long and bits and pieces dragged out, I was under an impression that Assembly Bailey wasn't even at the event. 
in terms of following some of the statements that are being made. I was under those issues. And if they had, and I think they've let... Sorry, and I think these individuals that have done this have let their colleagues down. I shouldn't be the only one angry of it. You should be angry at it in some ways, and you need to deal with it in, within your own party, as I suspect some of your national politicians have think in some of the comments they've made of their anger about it. So no. So no on this occasion, because I thought this morning we could have dealt with it in the proper way. Someone gets up, makes a point of personal explanation, and then we step on and we move on and we get on with it. That was not forthcoming. Not forthcoming. I did see the leader of the Conservatives try to indicate, Chair, I don't think you saw or you turned a blind eye or whatever, but either way, I know there are things that would make us all feel uncomfortable about those issues. So I can't accept that amendment. I do, in not accepting the amendment, recognise what you say about others. The circumstances of all that that's undermined the leadership in tackling this awful vi virus and the implication in our communities is one that's being dragged out and is bringing politicians, not just your party, me, other politicians around the table are questioning us every time we say, why should we do what you say? Why should you do what we say, what we're doing? We've brought, effectively, we are all guilty, as far as the public is concerned, <coughs> of where it is. And that's why I think it needs to be said there. And yet, I would, I would give some, if there were other flouters, and there have been other flouters of both, I think, in my party and others, and I will condemn them as well. But on this occasion, we're talking about us here in London and the implications we've got and why I can't accept that amendment on this occasion. Thank you. There being any other speakers on this, I will therefore take Assembly Member Hall's motion first. Uh, all those in favour of Assembly Member Hall's uh, motion? Um, um, oh, an amendment to the original motion. Uh, oh, please indicate. Uh, that is one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight in favour, Chair. And all those against Assembly Member Hall's uh, proposal? That is one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen against Chair. That falls. So that's for, uh, fallen. And now the, uh, uh, the motion as proposed and so, orally amended. Ap apologies, Chair. It's the amendment in the, the, amendment. Name, in the name of Assembly Member Duval. In the amendment as orally uh, changed, so not the one that's written down, but with a slight change. Uh, and so can I see all those in favour of Assembly Member uh, Duval's proposal? That is one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen in favour, Chair. And all those against? That's none against, Chair. That is carried. Uh, we now need to vote on the motion as amended, Chair. Right, so the motion is amended, so as amended by Assemblymember Duval. All those in favour, please indicate. That is one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen in favour, Chair. And all those against? That is no votes against, Chair. Thank you. Now, by my estimate, that's pretty much the end of the meeting. So thank you, thank you, members, and hopefully next time um, we won't have to drag in a personal heater. Yeah. Um, but date of next meeting? Oh, didn't I do date of next? Yeah, I, did. I did it earlier. Yeah, yeah. I did it earlier. Apologies. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah.